Okay. Well, it's five five oh three, so I think um, we can start the meeting. Uh, so I will call the February eighth, twenty twenty two meeting of the Finance Committee to order. I'm required to announce that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. I am Councilor Rachel Mayori, and I will be presiding over this meeting. Uh, President Nash, would you uh, call the roll for us? I would be delighted. Uh, Councilor Labarge. Here. Councilor Nash. Here. Councilor Mayori. Here. And Councilor Moulton. Present. Uh, everybody is here, Chair. Excellent. We, then we can proceed. Um, so I just want to make an announcement for the public that we have, um, despite what's not on the agenda, this is a time that, that we usually have general public comment. So if you have a general public comment, um, now is the time that you could make that. But I would encourage uh, folks who have comments about a specific agenda item to wait until that agenda item is on the floor, at which time I will open up the floor for comments then. Um, and those comments should be pertinent to that agenda item. Um, we're very interested in hearing from the public tonight. Uh, and also the committee is tasked with making, uh, has a, we have a task and I would like to make some progress on that. So those are the two things I will be balancing. Uh, as you know, the great thing about subcommittees is there is a little bit more latitude. So as my discretion as chair, I am not playing at this point on timing comments with a timer but would ask for, um, the, the, that those who speak are succinct and try to keep their comments to two to three minutes. You really just wanna get all voices you know, heard. And I'm, I'm ideally trying to keep this meeting to two hours. It's five, you know, five so around seven. Uh, so I'll be watching that. And you know, if it goes on too long, I might have to, to kind of wrap up comment, but I, I wanna see if this will work for us. So uh, again, if you are, comment, want to give a comment um, on a specific agenda item, uh, please wait for that agenda item to, uh, to come up on the floor. We only have two, so hopefully we'll get there soon. Um, so if possible, use the, when it does, when, when you like to speak, please use the raise hand feature. Um, and if for some reason that's not working, you know, you're welcome to wave your, your arms and I will endeavor to notice. Uh, okay, so first up, I just want to see if there's any general public comment. I am not seeing any general public comment. Uh, so we will move on to our first agenda item, which is the second quarter financial report. I believe that we are going to be hearing from finance director um, Marty. The approval of the minutes. Oh, there she is. Good evening, uh, Director Nardi. Good evening. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Uh, You're welcome. Counselors, did you want me to share my screen and share the reports that I handed out? Oh, I'd like that, would... please. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, they were sent to you, I believe, but I am happy yeah. to share my screen and kind of go through. Um, can you see that? And my, and my yeah. make it a little enlarge mm -hmm. it a little more that would be great all righty and also charlene if you could use your pointer just to point to the item that you're speaking to absolutely um okay i don't know what that is let's uh i don't know what happens when i hit fifth page nothing yeah you page zoom i just want to zoom yeah Hmm. Let's zoom to, we do like 150. Woo. Okay. Is that too oh, large? That actually, that actually works because I don't think anything's cut off. Well, I, I'll have to scroll a little bit. Right. You'll have to scroll. Widthwise it works. All right. So, um, so this first report, um, what I'm going to be going through, it, this is our general fund revenues. And if you remember from, um, actually only three, one of you is, is new. And I kind of wrote this up thinking that I would have newer counselors, but so your general fund revenues as, as the mayor went over at the joint meeting, um, the first section here is um, our excise taxes and our taxes. So I was just gonna talk a little bit about the hotel motel tax. 
So as you can see, it's at um, 400. So let me first say, so this is the heading that we're looking at. And then each of these top columns, you're gonna see our original estimate of our revenue, any adjustments, um, and then the revised estimate, which is what our final is. And that's the column you really wanna pay attention to. That's what we're expecting to come in. This fourth column here, the actual year to date revenue is what we've collected to date. And this report was pulled for a December 31st end of uh, quarter. And then over here, the remaining revenue column, that is how much money we need, we're expecting to come in to meet the budget. And then this last column percent um, collected, actually the best way to review these are the first thing that I do when I look at, so we're at 50% of the year, at least that's the end of the second quarter. So I wanna scan this and I wanna make sure that most of these are above 50 or above. And if they aren't, then I wanna look a little deeper to say, why is that not at 50%? So just going through, if you look at motor vehicle excise, our budget is 465,000. We've actually um, collected motor excise. So we've, we're still, we only collected 20%. Um, so for the motor vehicle excise, I apologize. I wanted to start with hotel motel, but that is, so I don't know about you, but I just received my, my motor vehicle excise. Those usually go out now. They come in, they're usually due. The first big chunk for cities and towns is for the March 7th. So in the next quarter, you'll see that number really jump up. Um, so that 20%, that's the reason for that. So if we go to hotel motel um, here, 465,000 is what we're, we're, we've actually received. We budgeted 1. Point, excuse me, I'm having trouble following these along, uh, 250,000. So we are up 186% of our budget. So we're collected, we've already collected more than we anticipated. Um, meals, the same thing when you look at it. Um, 500,000 is what we budgeted. We've already collected 366,000. So we are at 73% of our estimated budget. Um, then the same as marijuana. These are the three big ones that we kind of look at at this time of year. Um, again, marijuana excise, you go, we budgeted 1.1 um, million. We've already collected 650. So we're at about 56%. Um, and this is, as you remember, um, the mayor mentioned at the joint meeting was that as more and more um, shops come online, our market share may change. So that's something that we're keeping an eye on. And as you can see, these, this is much lower than we were probably two years ago. Um, but we think this is where we're gonna be. We're hoping this is where it kind of levels off. Um, so then, um, then if we go down here, and I, again, I mentioned this more for the, for the newer folks, um, it was asked what pilots are, and then the mayor talked about these pilots that we have agreements with um, folks to pay who don't otherwise pay taxes. So here you'll see that we're budgeting. It's not a lot in some of these uh, instances. We're budgeting for pilots and when they come in. The reason you're seeing a lot of zeros here is because those, have they, those get actually calculated and sent out after the tax rate is set. So that gets done in December. So we haven't received all those payments. And again, they're, they're not huge numbers, but they are important for us. So then if we move on to page two, um, parking revenues, that's that first group here. In fact, I think there might even be one on the other page, if I'm not mistaken. Nope, just the heading. Okay, so these are all of our parking revenues, except for the last one, which is the ambulance services. Um, so in looking at these, um, we collected for the second quarter about 691,000. That's the total for all of these that were collected. Um, that is much improved compared to the 361,000 from last year at the same time. Um, it's still not back to pre-pandemic -pre -pre levels, but we're running at about 70% compared to pre-pandemic, -pre I'm sorry, um, levels. So it's re rebounding but not quite as quickly as hotel and motel and meals. Um, but again, we're, we're on target to meet our estimated revenues, if not beat for this year, FY 2022. Um, the last one here, ambulance services. Again, you'll see that we budgeted 1.9 million, already at 50% through the year, we've collected 1.4 million. So we are, are ahead of where we need to be. 
um, that has been a significant revenue, especially the last couple of years for the city, um, for all the reasons we're well aware of. Uh, the next column or the next set uh, is charges for services. And if you remember in the joint um, meeting, this was one of the uh, pie section, the sections of the pie um, that we talk about. And I'm, I wasn't going to go through these in detail, but um, you know, these groupings here, you can just look at like what comes in. We have seven cemetery internments and those have come in, um, you know, city clerk licenses or fees, excuse me. And you can just look at the different things. Um, one of the things I will point out on this one is um, I'm gonna go to licenses and permits, same kind of thing. And I just wanted to note that we, we did notice and it was mentioned by the mayor that the building inspector permits are down. Um, and again, those are, uh, we believe is because of the supply chain. So we're a little behind there, but we're gonna keep an eye on that. And that could pick up again in spring. Um, and certainly as the supply chain um, kind of clears up, we, we hope to see more in that one. And then my next thing, I was gonna go to page four. And I'm sorry, my computer's really slow in moving this. Okay. Um, here, I think I just wanted to mention, so this top was the state revenue that was mentioned. This is one of our uh, pieces of the pie for our revenue. Um, this comes in when it comes in from the state. Um, so these are all the monies that come in from that. And then the other big one that we like to talk about is the parking tickets. Um, again, those are less than they were before. And in part, not only is that because of the pandemic, but it's also because we put in park mobile. So it gives people more options. You know, you're not just using cash to park, you can use the mobile app. And I think that has cut down wonderfully on a lot of the tickets. Um, so people, people are finding it much easier to pay for their parking. Um, so um, I think that's about all I have to say about general revenues. Then if we go to the enterprise revenues, um, everything is tracking as expected. Again, this, this uh, document is the same as the other one. It's broken up by enterprise funds. So it starts with the sewer revenue. We go to this column here, which is the budget. This is the actual revenue we collected. And then really the remaining revenue. But then I always, again, look at the percent collected. Um, and again, that's where we really get a good handle on we're 50% through the year, what does the revenues, what are they tracking at? So again, um, some of them are much higher and, and that could also be the way their revenues come in. Um, they don't always, it's not always an easy split. It doesn't always come in exactly broken up by 12 months out of the year. So, but these are looking really good and they're tracking as we expect. Um, pretty much water is a bit down from last year. Um, and we are about 100,000 more in sewer, about 120,000 more in stormwater, and we're about the same in solid waste. Um, and again, we're, we're kind of watching water, but we're getting closer to pre-pandemic levels with the enterprise fund. Um, and then if we go to the general fund expenditures, um, so just to explain this form a little bit, this is broken up, as you can see, by department. And then you have the city council and you have their PS line, which is also known as their salary line. And then you have their OM line, which is they're known as OM for our expenses. And then you'll see that for each department. So again, my first thing when I look at this report is I run right over here to the percent used. And I remind myself I'm 50% through the year. So how are we tracking our expenses? If things jump out to me, like anything that's over 50% and I'm not 55%, I don't worry about too much. But when mom starts seeing, you know, 65, 75, 85, that's when we start to go, well, why is that? Um, so again, if you go through here, we are doing really well. Everything's tracking as expected. Excuse me, I went a little fast there, I apologize. Um, so everything looks good, but you will notice on these, um, some things that I wanted to, to mention is, uh, um, if we travel all the way down, let me say, where do I want to, like the department of uh, DPW. So, whoa, 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 this is a smaller report then. So if we go to the DPW, as you can see, um, that report right here, 
So they are um, highways, they were only at like 36, 31%. So then you may say like, why is that the case? Well, DPW projects, yes, they happen from July 1st, but really like you're, you're bidding and stuff in the winter and you start your projects in the spring. And sometimes they carry over by, you know, encumbering funds, the projects. So you'll see, my point is you'll see more activity in the spring than you actually do. We're kind of wrapping up on the beginning part of the year. So that's why these are lower expenditures. You also snow and ice, that's another one you'll see this being very low, but obviously at the end of December, we've just started the winter. You know, that number will look totally different when we get to the end of March and I'm showing you this in April. Um, and then on the flip side of that, if we go to the very end of this um, budget and we look at, oh, I went too far. If we look at the ones that are 100% and I've missed them, um, workers' comp insurance um, and con uh, contributory retirement. When you look at those, you're going to see those at 99 and 100%, and that's because we do lump sums. So you're, we're just paying once out right at the beginning of the year. So that's why you'll see that. So that's not something to worry about. Um, that's not an ongoing expense. Um, so again, when I looked at this and I, I looked into everything, things look really good. Um, we're tracking just as expected for revenues and expenditures. And then the last piece is the enterprise expenditures. Same form. Again, I, I peruse down this column. That's kind of your first blush at any of these. Where are we in the year and how do we stack up to those percentages? Um, and again, we're looking you know, really good for expenditures. We, I, I always want to kind of see a little under the 50%. Um, and again, not all of them are exact because not all of our bills are divided up, as I said, like it, exactly over the 12 months. Some are quarterly payments, some, you know, for revenues and others are, we pay six months and then we, you know, don't pay in, again until the end of June. So um, that's how they kind of work. But if you look at these, we're, we're looking really good with our revenues and our expenses. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much, Director. Um, Committee members, do you have any questions? Um, uh, Councilor Nash. I just wanted to thank um, uh, Director Nardi for that um, very, um, uh, that was a great report. Thank you. I, I, I know I've heard of these reports before, but that, that, was, that was great. Um, I did have a question about, you mentioned how state revenues kind of come in when they show up. When do state revenues show up? Do they show up before we spend the money or after we spend the money? <laughs> it would be nice if they all came in before we spent the money, but no, they come out, they come in throughout the year. So right. like if I go back to um, general fund revenues and I will pull it back up, but let me pull these up um, and I'll share my screen again. So, whoops, I gotta hit, yes, share. So if you look at this for, um, you know, I, it varies because um, like, it looks like the abatements for uh, came in at 100%. Um, chapter 70, I think comes in at, you know, quarterly. So like we're exactly at 50% for chapter 70 and payments in lieu of taxes for the state owned land. Um, if I'm following this across, right? You know, um, charter school aid, that's at 64%. Veterans benefits, those come in as we apply for them. So we're applying for a reimbursement for veterans. Um, and as you can see, you know, Steve and his crew, the director is doing a really good job. Um, those do take time to come in. So 40% is, is doing really well this time of year. Mm -hmm. um, unrestricted general aid, you know, we're at 50%. So I would say those are coming in quarterly. They're paying us quarterly. Okay. Um, good to know we're, we're the, the that the funding from the state, however limited it, it is, is rolling in. So yeah, thank you. It does come in on a regular basis. Uh, Councilor Labarge, uh, unmute yourself there, Councilor. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Chardine. I, I I have two questions. I, I think I had read an article in the Gazette in regards to the marijuana shops. 
just not in Northampton, but in other communities that, you know, if you look at what we started here in the city of Northampton with the marijuana shops, we were making a good profit on that. And we have decreased on that, but we're not the only towns or cities who are having that problem. Correct. Correct? Yes. Okay. So, and, and again, I think that's, it's, it's not unique to Northampton. I think as, because Northampton was one of the first communities to have um, those, um, that product within their community and the, and the opportunity to have those um, shops, they benefited early on as being the only place and, and sales were high and the market share for them was high. And now, of course, more communities and even more states are starting to open up shops. So, so again, our market share will, of course, change. Right. Also, my second question, which I had talked with the city solicitor on a problem that apparently some of my residents had with the last budget hearing that we had. And looking at under the legal part of what we have here for an original appropriation down the line going across at 275,000. And it's amazing if you look at the budget book, it was like increased significantly. I think it was in 2019, significantly. So I see that we're back where we started from at 275,000 and we have an available budget for the legal part at what, 193,270? So I believe the legal is, is budgeted for this year at 275,000 for FY 2022. Right. So what is this available budget out of that 275? Oh, so you, what you're looking at, the available budget of 193,000? Yes. So, so if you look at the column, the revised budget is 275. That's what yep, our budget right. is. We've spent 81,000, which leaves 193,000 for the rest of the year. So the 81,000, because some of my residents, which I told, um, our city solicitor had problems with looking at the budget book. Like they would get on the website to try uh -huh. to find out what lawsuits, right? How much was the city paying for lawsuits? And they couldn't find this type of information. And in talking with our city solicitor, he agreed with me in the budget book. There's not a lot of information in there to help residents, especially our taxpayers here in the city, of finding out, I don't care about the names of who the city is suing, the process here, right? How many cases are in litigation? And if not, that we've sent it out of the city of Northampton to another law firm. I think it's common sense to wanna know that type of stuff when you're a taxpayer. So are you suggesting that this should be something written up in the budget book or? Yes. yes. Okay. So in the next budget book. Yes. So, so again, I guess I'll have to look into that, um, Councillor Labarge, because I'll be honest with you, I'm not that familiar with what's written up for each department. Um, and also the budget book, I, I think it pro you're probably right. It probably does a little synopsis of what the prior year was and right. what the year going forward. But I think, I think we would have to be careful of, of what information was provided, but certainly we can look into to how we could address your concern and make sure people get information that is public information. Right. You don't have to put down who is suing in that. How many cases have we won in the city? We have a city solicitor who handles this type of stuff. And how many did we lose? That's it. You don't have to give the names. Taxpayers want this information. So it's something, absolutely, I will make note of it, and we can certainly um, look into how we can address that concern. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Moulton. Thank you. Thank you, Director Nardi. As the uh, new Councilor on the Finance Committee, I appreciate your clear reports. 
Uh, I wanted to focus on the three uh, um, revenue sources on page one of the uh, general fund revenues that you highlighted, uh, motels, uh, hotel meals and marijuana. All three of those are up from your, your projection. Is it fair to attribute that to a recovering economy and perhaps conservative estimates on, on your part? Yes. And have you seen any indications that this would not continue in the second half of the year? Or are you cautiously optimistic that we'll see the, uh, the upward trend continue? I, our hope is that we'll see the upward trend continue. But I think as the mayor said at the joint meeting, we're, we're being cautious because we don't know what Omicron, if any, effect it had. However, you know, we might see a little bit, um, especially in the in the parking, maybe not so much for motor vehicle excise. So you have to motor vehicle, excuse me, I'm saying motor vehicle, hotel, motel and um, uh, meals are quarterly. So the, the payments we got in right after December are not for the quarter of October, November and December. Those were payments, those were payments for activity that happened in July, August and September. So remember the state's sending us those. So for everything, all the activity that happened around hotel, motel and meals in July, August and September were collected by the state and they sent us those by the end of December. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so I'm sorry. So parking, just so clear, parking, we collect monthly on our own. So that is like, you see effects more immediate. So we may not see an effect even in the third quarter. We may see it in the fourth quarter is my point. But yes, I am hopeful. Hopefully we will continue to see the trend of going back. So how, how would you then apply that excess revenue to spending later in this budget year? So excess revenue is actually, um, you can't spend excess revenue right out of the general fund. What happens is the general fund at the end of June 30th, the books get closed and then the general fund is actually pushed. Um, so I always think of it as the general fund is closed. It gets pushed to free cash. It gets pushed to a whole process that gets pushed through the department of revenue. And then our free cash is certified in November. So at that point, then we could spend after November, that additional revenue that becomes part of our free cash, but you Thank don't spend it throughout the year. Thank you. I, I have a question, um, Director Nardi. I'm just curious when I know that we have a, um, some openings, you know, um, on vacancies in like the DPW. What happens with those salaries when they're not, they go um, un, unfilled for so, a while? Same thing. So those yeah. would be like, um, and the mayor talked briefly about this at the joint meeting. That's one of the things that makes free cash too. So if we have um, unfilled vacancies or um, budgets that are underspent, those monies also contribute to your free cash. Oh, okay, thank you. Are there any other uh, questions from the committee members? Looks like, thank you so much, uh, Director Nardi. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great evening. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Okay, so moving on, um, just to clarify, do we need to make a recommendation on this? <laughs> it's just a, pre it's a presentation. Correct. So it's not yeah. an order, okay, yeah. So moving on. Good question. Uh, <laughs> moving on, um, our second and final agenda item under financial orders is, well, under financial orders at least, is 22.0. Uh, 016, an order authorizing a five-year contract for IT services, department equipment, and software. And this was referred uh, by city council um, February 2nd this year. Um, so we were, you know, just to review, we were tasked with, uh, this committee was tasked with um, kind of reviewing this and coming up with um, some criteria. Um, and so before we, uh, I think I was just for the public, I want, well, I think the pro a process note, which is I'd like for, um, I, I, let's, let's start with 
public comment on the agenda item. Mm -hmm. And then we will hear, and I would like to have a discussion with committee members. And um, uh, there's a, uh, some folks here. I, I see Joe Cook, the procurement officer, um, Antonio Pagan, and, and, and uh, have a little bit of time discussing this. Uh, and then we can open up the floor again to um, question, you know, questions or comments. There's a lot of us, so I might have to limit, I, I uh, give everyone one chance with one comment or, or question after, you know, we have this discussion. But we can start with um, public, uh, I'm not, not public, comment on this agenda item. So it should really be relevant to the, the, the agenda item. So you could use the raise hand feature. And as I say, uh, we're, we're all just gonna try to be mindful of, uh, so we can get um, some voices in here. I see the first hand up is Amy Coffin. Let's see, Amy Coffin. Can you unmute your, let me see if you can unmute yourself. Maybe you cannot. I, I think I can. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Amy Coffin. I'm the lesser known Coffin twin. Um, I'm also a medical student. Um, and I lived in Northampton for two years after living in the Silicon Valley area for um, most of my adult life. And I worked in healthcare technologies. Um, and I wanted to share some of the lessons from my time in tech. I also worked um, with some sanctuary city initiatives back in California. Um, so I have a little bit of experience in that regard as well. Um, I think the big upshot of what I wanna say is that healthcare, health data companies business model is to stifen data. Um, they build databases that they can buy and sell. And I think that's a really hard thing for the public to wrap their heads around. <laughs> um, even in healthcare with, uh, with policies in place like HIPAA, um, patients aren't well protected against tech companies, um, even if they're cancer patients. So I have a, I have a friend who's a patient advocate, um, who her struggle with reclaiming her data from a tech company has now lasted much longer than cancer. Um, and so it's just a really big deal, um, to think about these issues deeply because once, once you've passed the threshold, there's just no going back once a company has your data. Um, to give a very specific example of this, 23andMe um, doesn't make money on their $99 test kits. They make money from the data they aggregate from everybody who sends them their spit. Um, and that's, a, again, a hard concept to wrap your head around, but it's what's called metadata. Um, and because they're the ones who process the data and de-identify it, that's how they then own it. And it, so it's kind of similar to what um, Councillor Labarge mentioned about how you can publish a report on how many city cases that have been won um, without giving taxpayer info. That's the exact logic, except these companies are building databases that can be bought and sold. And I'd like to also just emphasize that the general public has the most rights as a patient of healthcare systems when it comes to data. And these companies are still very shameless. And so it really makes me personally very concerned to think about the general public data being collected on the general public um, in a place where there aren't actually any protections at all. And um, overall, I just really am a firm believer that it, it, 90, it's, it's highly, highly unlikely that this company has the general public's interest in mind or is gonna properly protect them at all because that's just the way of the world in the Silicon Valley, unfortunately. So I just wanted to share that. I'm gonna leave my um, email in the chat if anybody has any further questions that they wanna ask me. <laughs> Okay, and just one process note, um, Councillor Moulton, if you have the bandwidth, uh, we were thinking that maybe if we just would like uh, track um, comments a bit, I think we talked about that, but just, um, just so we, you know, when we go back to full council, we might ha ideally have a tracking of, of, you know, of the public concerns, even if it's just one sentence, but no yeah. pressure, but I just uh, thought that would be uh, that, uh, icing on uh, the Councilor Mayori, that is uh, fine. I am a veteran note taker, so <laughs> I am happy to uh, record some notes about the conversation. Thank you. Yes, I wish I wish that were my skill set, but it's not quite. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to Amy. And I see Ashwin Ravi Kumar up. Ashwin. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. My name is Ashwin Ravi Kumar. Uh, I teach at Amherst College and live in Amherst and come to Northampton quite a lot. Uh, and I just wanted to offer some kind of framing remarks about 
the conversation that you're about to have on the finance committee. So the kind of agenda item for the finance committee and what was forwarded to the committee uh, was to develop a rubric or set of criteria around social responsibility uh, that should govern the third parties that the city contracts with, right? And this decision was taken kind of in response to the an emerging consensus uh, at the council meeting that we need cameras and we just need to figure out how to make sure that we're not buying cameras from the worst possible companies, right? So, you know, companies like Motorola are on UN watch lists. They uh, give data over to ICE and they support apartheid regimes around the world, right? But I think it's important to note that uh, these specific concerns of just not dealing with the absolute worst types of companies in this space, um, which I think I think you'll find and other folks will speak to this, I think, um, is basically going to be anyone who's in this space. But really, the values of the community and the concerns that that were raised at the council meeting are a little deeper than that. And I just hope you can keep this in mind, even as you discuss a rubric that might make sense or criteria that makes sense. Makes sense, right? So at the top of the council meeting the other day, we heard 90 minutes of testimony from dozens of community members, and they weren't saying we want to uh, have socially responsible cameras. They were saying we don't want to keep investing money in surveillance at all. They were saying that surveillance leads to a situation where data can be handed over to ICE, where data is handed over to ICE. They were saying that we want to not be distracted by more technology for police as a, as a false solution and instead continue to invest these types of resources in real alternatives that create safety following the recommendations of the Northampton Policing Review Commission, right? So there's an overwhelming consensus among organizations from Black Lives Matter to Mi Gente, other migrant justice groups, indigenous organizations. Uh, if you look through uh, one of the lists that I think Ya Ping put together of who is really opposing cameras as a solution for community safety, it's pretty unanimous, right? There's also a consensus among scholars um, who study science and technology studies, uh, who are experts in the ways in which these types of technologies impact um, vulnerable communities, that they are basically never used to help anyone. And they're really used to increase criminalization, increase harm. So fundamentally, even as you think about a rubric that matches our values, if we really value racial justice, if we're really committed to you know, not having facial recognition technology, uh, if we're really committed to uh, building the kind of, to, to, to implementing the recommendations of the NPRC, pretty much no company is gonna pass, uh, is gonna pass muster, right? So I think it's important to think about what's gonna happen in that case and what will you go back to the council to report back on um, if a rubric that matches these values is advanced and we find indeed that no one who's offering these types of technologies uh, is up to that. Um, and I just wanna close real quickly by kind of offering an analogy um, because there's, there's been, some experts, some people with expertise in these areas who have been suggesting, insisting, I think without really meeting a high burden of proof, uh, that there's a lot of harm caused by the status quo of kind of faulty dash cams. But uh, if you actually look to what experts say, and I think we're about to hear from some, so I'll, I'll step back in a sec, there really is an overwhelming consensus that cameras don't help, that cameras are not used to actually hold police accountable. And so as someone who works in the environmental space and works on climate justice, I sort of feel like this just reminds me of climate change, right? Because there's an overwhelming consensus among folks that study climate change, among scientists, that climate change is a real uh, threat, that anthropogenic climate change is an existential threat, and there's certain things that we need to do to address it. And yet there's so much media that says, well, there's two sides to this, or well, oh, that sounds bad. But anyway, we need to still continue to get more fossil fuels online, right? So to hear, you know, 50 people say, hey, cameras are bad, to see hundreds of orgs that are in contact with criminalized communities say, we don't want these technologies. And to see the council kind of hear all that and then go, okay, we hear that. Right, so what's, what's a rubric that would uh, get us the least bad after hearing all those concerns just kind of gave me deja vu about climate change. And I just think that analogy to me has been powerful in thinking about where our real values lie and what we ought to be really pursuing here. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Let's see, uh, let's see, um, Dana 13 Pro, Dana's 13 Pro. <laughs> Hi, uh, I can't turn on my camera and there's gonna be a little background noise, so I apologize. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm gonna speak really briefly. I wanna talk, uh, I think it would be really helpful because the things I'm gonna say are on the one hand, very intuitive, uh, they're sort of intuitively obvious, 
but there's been so much pro camera propaganda over the past couple decades that um, I think a discussion is going to be much more helpful than just me saying it because I've certainly had the experience where I say these things and people nod and then the very next thing they say is but cameras keep police accountable and just hearing the data that they don't doesn't undo that belief hearing the stories of how they don't doesn't undo that belief but sometimes participating in a conversation where you really sort of talk through what your understanding is about what harm is can help so I do want to, like, I, I would like to be available for that discussion. <sighs> Just three points, and I'm going to make them as quickly as possible. First, you're going to have trouble finding somebody to surveil Northampton with cameras uh, to provide the tech so that the police can surveil the population continuously, who isn't evil. And the reason is that you are doing something bad and only bad people sell this tech. There's no good police surveillance going on where you're gonna find a really progressive company that has comprehensive surveillance. It's a little bit like being like, we wanna buy a nuclear bomb, but we don't wanna buy it from a bad company. You're buying something that's harmful and you're not gonna find like an ACLU sponsored company doing this. So that's one of the obstacles that you have. The second thing is that this tech exists to put people in cages. That's why the police want it. By watching people all the time, they are able to put more people in cages. They want to do that and this helps them. So that's what you're doing. That's the main purpose. The police are not asking for this tech so that they can be more accountable to the public. The tech is completely under their control and they're completely able to do whatever they want and not get caught by their own tech. This is not hard when you control the tech. And this is intuitive to anyone that's ever been interviewed on camera. If you're the editor of the documentary, you're, you're in charge, right? The police or the cinematographers there, they're in charge. So th that's intuitive, but it will slip away and it will slip out of your heads. And this is natural and normal. And it's, it's, a, it's a natural effect of being propagandized. The next thing to remember is that defense attorneys like me, we are all trained to focus on the one exception. We will get 999 cases over and over again of cameras doing, uh, putting our clients in incriminating positions that make it look like they're doing a crime. And there's nothing we can do about it. And those cases are often unwinnable and we don't engage with them substantively, we engage with them on sentencing, right? We're just trying to minimize how much time this person's gonna spend in a cage by arguing to the judge that they're a good person. We don't engage very deeply with what happened on the camera. One time out of a thousand, we're gonna get this amazing footage that we think is gonna blow the case wide open and we work really hard on it. And that's the case that we remember because that's what we're trained to do. That's our training, we focus on that. Our sense is that without the camera, we have no job. We have no positive role to play in this community that we're interacting with because without the camera, all we do in our minds is sensing. What we forget is that the camera is responsible for those 999 sentencings as well, right? So if you ask the community that's being surveilled, they'll say, get rid of the sentencing. 999 people in cages versus one person who maybe has an argument not to be in a cage is not worth it. If you ask the defense attorney who only interacts with the population in this limited way, and I'm guilty of this too, you get very excited about the case you get to litigate. That's what you're trained to do. You get to research things and write memoranda and it's great. I love it. I love trials, but it's not worth it for 999 people to be in a cage so that I can sort of activate the skills that I learned in law school. And it's natural as a defense attorney to sort of focus on the one thing that you really got to dig your teeth into because that's what you remember. That's why you need to look at data scientists and not people like me who just have anecdotes and what we concentrate on. Listen to data scientists and listen to the people being surveilled. Do they wanna be surveilled? Are they like, we're only safe when we're being surveilled. Surveillance is what makes me safe. No. And there's a reason they're saying no. So please listen to the communities on that. Now, I just wanna remind you that as soon as I stop talking, you are all going to start believing in some way that these cameras hold police accountable. I have never, heard of a Northampton police officer being disciplined because of something that was caught on camera. They're not accountability features for police. They're criminalization features for the rest of us. 
if they were accountability features for the police, we wouldn't put the footage in the police hands. You would hire somebody, you could hire me, hire a defense attorney. All the footage would go to me and I would release it only if it was exculpatory or if it caught the police doing something bad. The police aren't gonna want that because they know that this isn't footage that is used to protect communities from them. They know that it is a weapon they have against the community. So they're not gonna go for that. Interestingly, the police are so much more aware of this than the rest of us that they don't care about the one case that me and Marissa and Rachel and the defense community can get really riled up about, right? They know the other 999 cases are where they're, that's, that's the system working, as they would say it. That's the people just going into cages because they catch them uh, doing something wrong on the street and they get to pull them over and uh, have an argument about whether, they're carry, whether they participated in helping somebody do a thing that led to someone else doing drugs selling drugs, right? They know that they're ni the 999 cases is where they're, that's, that's the meat of their job. So uh, they're not confused about what they're doing. They're, to they're gonna be totally happy to let me and Marissa and Rachel do all of our like whatever shenanigans we wanna do with the one case where maybe the police messed up and let themselves get caught on camera, let something exculpatory get on camera. It's, if you do not buy new cameras, this will be a net benefit to black, brown, and poor people. There's a reason nobody from CPCS, the public defender's office, is here going, you really need more and better surveillance. That would be great for the criminal defense. They're, they're, they, don't, they don't have a position of more and better surveillance. That's not what's going on here. And there's a reason for that. Because institutionally, there is awareness that it's the Commonwealth's burden they have to prove that somebody did something wrong and the more surveillance they can gather, the more they can make people look guilty. So these are not tools for exonerating people and they're not tools for holding police accountable. These are tools for criminalizing people. So you can wait, there's no rush here. You can let all these cameras die and it will not matter in terms of uh, advancing a progressive agenda. You do not need to rush out into a contract with Motorola. All right, and again, I think it'd be so helpful to have discussion on some of this stuff because the propaganda has been out there for decades. Ben Bricado talked about that, about how the police have used their shootings of people to try to get more surveillance tax. So, you know, let's have a discussion and not just leave it to like me saying stuff and then everyone immediately defaulting to, yes, but accountability, because I understand how that happens. Conversation is how we get over that together. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Dana. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, Rachel Weber. Um, hi, everybody. Um, good evening. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm here in, in, in two respects, like I was at the at the previous city council meeting. Um, one is as a, as a defense attorney, and, and another is a, as an American Jewish person who's incredibly concerned about any kind of additional contracting with Motorola. So let me first uh, agree with what um, Dana Goldblatt just said um, in terms of the role of these cameras. The role of these cameras is absolutely to um, capture incriminating evidence and saying, well, look, perhaps this tech has the capability for facial recognition. Perhaps this tech has the capability for license scanning, um, but we're not gonna use that. We promise we're not gonna use that. First of all, that's similar to the argument, guns don't kill people, people kill people, right? It's like the, the technology itself has these very terrible capabilities and you know, just saying, well, you know, it, it only depends on, on whose hands it's, it's in, um, really falls short of acknowledging the danger in these technologies at all and what their purpose is. Um, and I, you, we can't remove, we can't say, look, we love Northampton so much that we just entirely trust that um, these technologies are only going to be used for purposes that are beneficial to the community. It's just that, you know, we're, we're humans, we're fallible. There are systems at play, there's systemic 
uh, racism at play just in, in, in every system in this country. This isn't a specific indictment of Northampton. Um, I'm just, every single, every single institution in this city, in this state, in this country is imbued with systemic racism. And so for us to say, yes, this technology has all these capabilities, but we promise we won't use it in a bad way is a really dangerous argument. Also, it's an argument that cities around the country have made that's a promise that cities around the country have made and have found out that that did not turn out to be true. That, you know, LAPD, for instance, made the exact same promise with very similar tech. And after some um, uh, requests for records, it turned out that in one year, they used the facial recognition 30,000 times. This was after, a, you know, resolutions that they wouldn't use it and things like that. Um, so, so that's incredibly important. The tech itself, the we cannot ignore its purpose. Um, so that's that's one important piece. Another important piece is that just because something's captured on video doesn't mean, oh, that's the end of the case. What happens when something's captured on video is that either it goes to a motion hearing or goes to a trial. And if it goes to and either of those things, the, the video has to be interpreted. And interpretation is again, a place where implicit bias just comes in our brains it's not a choice we have it's not happening in our frontal cortex it's in our all of our brains are just programmed to be influenced by the culture in, in which we're surrounded by and so you know you look at um there was a police officer in springfield who literally is caught on camera you know beating latino teenagers yelling at them that he's going to plant drug evidence on them on camera he was acquitted a few weeks ago you know, so and, and there's plenty of stories like that all over the country. But, you know, I might get video of field sobriety tests that a client of mine is taking on the side of the road. And just because I get the video and just because I think it's good doesn't mean that the Commonwealth is like, well, OK, I'm going to ditch this case. They're like, OK, you think it's good. My job is to, you know, oppose, uh, you know, it's is to, you know, do what I can to convict this person. And so then it goes to trial and then it's up to the jury. And any good defense attorney will admit to you that we've been surprised by losses, even with surveillance footage. So just because you capture something on video doesn't magically make it objective. It's still humans that have to observe the video and make a determination about what it means. Um, so I, I, I want to, you know, those two points are, are just so incredibly important in addition to everything anyone is, everyone is saying about let's actually ask the communities, you know, to say to communities of color and impoverished communities, we know what's best for you. What's best for you is these cameras. While they're saying, we know what's best for us. What's best for us is safety within our community and knowing our neighbors and having, you know, having good means of communication between ourselves and having alternate systems of accountability. You know, just it, it's 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 uh, it's super troubling for particularly, you know, majority. The majority of people on this call are white. The majority of people in city council are white. And to say we know what's better for these communities than they know themselves. Um, let's not do that. Let's actually be led by the communities that are most affected. Um, so that's that's my piece as a criminal defense attorney. Motorola, I mean, the example that Dana gave of a nuclear bomb is really not far off. I mean, they have engaged in some of the most just heinous technology that you can imagine. They have been responsible for um, the, the types of technology that they've used in illegal settlements in Israel, where there's Palestinian land that Israel is slowly encroaching on with and it's illegal condemned by the essentially entire international community, except for the United States, um, been termined, determined to be apartheid uh, based on an Amnesty International report that just came out last week, where you have you know, Israeli only roads cutting through Palestinian land, you have a different justice system, different laws. You know, some of the tech that Motorola pr provides is that it sweeps the perimeter outside of the walls of these illegal settlements to catch Palestinians, maybe just walking to their land. And what happens when they catch them? They get shot and murdered or they get arrested and held under military detention uh, with, with no charges for months on end. It's the same tech that ICE uses to um, you know, do sweeps of the areas around ICE detention centers. The fact that this Motorola technology has literally been field tested by upholding apartheid regimes, I mean, it, it's again, it's just, it's, it's unconscionable that this town would entertain 
engaging in any kind of a contract with 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 this company and particularly around this technology where again the facial recognition the plate scanning the the architecture of apartheid that is in place right now in um in palestine could not it could not happen the way that it does without technology and it could not happen the way that it does without american technology and specifically motorola motorola not only as an american company but motorola owns large shares of israeli companies that also do all this tech um, and so we're talking, you know, again, checkpoints and uh, land confiscation and again, people being Palestinians being murdered, denied medical treatment. I've, I've seen it with my own eyes. I've been to the West Bank. I've seen what ambulance drivers go through and the to, the, to know that companies that I pay taxes, you know, to for their contracts that I would pay taxes to this city that would go to these contracts to do the things to people, human beings that I've seen um, in, in the West Bank is just, I mean, it's it's heartbreaking isn't the right word. It's it's infuriating and it's it's just, it's straight up injustice. If we do this, I think that it would be required to remove any notion of us as a sanctuary city. We cannot have this technology, particularly with this company, and still refer to ourselves as a sanctuary city. They are, they are mutually exclusive. Um, I mean, sure, you know, yes, many tech companies who do this type of surveillance are bad. That's very, very true. And also, we know a ton about what Motorola is doing because A, they're on a UN blacklist. They were warned about it in 2017. They went on the blacklist in 2020. Just in July of this past year, Norway's largest retirement accounts divested from Motorola and other companies that were benefiting, war profiteering from what's happening in Palestine um, and in the West Bank and, and, and in other parts of Palestine as well. Motorola was boycotted during the South African apartheid. So this is not a new history for Motorola. So th th just the, again, you know, and, and it's, not, it's not my job to say, oh, you know, let me provide you with, with an alternative. I mean, I, I don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm the defense attorney, right? You know, I, I'm trying to keep evidence out of the Commonwealth's hands. I'm trying to keep my clients away from surveillance. You know, I have clients uh -huh. who don't want to leave their house because they feel so surveilled when they walk around Northampton, they just feel like anytime they walk outside, they're gonna get accosted by the police. And that a little, a little interaction ends up blossoming into bigger charges, you know? And so this, this tech has a huge, terrible consequences for people in our community who are black, who are people of color, who are houseless. Um, it does not, it is, it is I, I completely agree with Dana that this is, there's no way to frame this as actually being about police accountability, because why do the, it's completely run by the police, it's stored by the police, you know, it's, it's, and also because the police know where the cameras are, and this happens all over the place, things, bad things happen to people outside of the range of the cameras. Um, so there's just no way to frame it as police accountability. It's just collecting more data and with literally one of the worst companies operating right now i mean it's just you know you if you read um if you read the un reports if you read the reports of people who've been boycotting motorola for decades um and like i said actually there's oops um there's a really good quote um from one of the norwegian uh, analysts um who was responsible for you know why the why they're divesting from um companies including uh, including Motorola, and, and I'll end on this quote. There is an unacceptable risk that the excluded companies, including Motorola, will contribute to the violation of human rights in war and conflict situations through their connection to the Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank. The connections are clear, and I just, I, I implore, I implore you all to not dismiss this as, you know, idealism or, or utopianism or something. This is very concrete. And there is very just concrete, clear, documented harm that will come from this technology. Okay, hey, thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, let's see, um, Elliot Oberholter. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yep. 
Great. Um, thank you so much for this chance to speak. I appreciate it a lot. Um, and I will go slower than I did at the main meeting. Um, so hopefully it will be easier to process as well. Um, so uh, uh, as a reminder, I'm, I'm speaking in my capacity as an immigration advocate, um, soon to be an immigration attorney if I survive law school. Um, and I'm currently in Holyoke, but I support folks navigating various immigration statuses uh, throughout the entirety of Western Massachusetts. Uh, Northampton is a pretty big hub for that work. Um, so that's the capacity I'm speaking in. And so what I, what I wanted to do really quickly first is to share a really common scenario that we see in immigration work um, in, in case the, the council isn't familiar with it and in case it's helpful. Um, so uh, in this really common scenario, and this happens all the time in Northampton and Greenfield throughout Western Massachusetts, um, is that someone is uh, a, an immigrant of various status or lack of status and is driving in a car um, and they're stopped by police in that car. That might be because they failed to signal. That might be because they were racially profiled. Um, it might be because um, uh, their car looks similar to one that was stolen. You know, any of these reasons that police give for stopping someone. Um, and while they are stopped, you know, we know from the meeting that the minute that the police turn on the lights to stop someone, they're being recorded. So at, at that moment of being stopped in a car, which is an extremely common situation, someone is being recorded. At that point, the cameras are in play. When someone is stopped, an extremely common thing is that they are driving without a license. And that may be because in Massachusetts, they are someone who is under the radar, who is, is actively not trying to be found by ICE and is that, in that kind of undocumented status. But actually, very commonly, it's because someone has applied for an immigration status and just hasn't been granted it yet. And this is an enormous population of people um, and there are people in your community. Someone who has applied for asylum, for example, will usually wait six months to a year for the document that allows them to apply for a driver's license. Meanwhile, someone who has applied for what's called a U visa will wait 13 years. So in that time in Massachusetts right now, you cannot get a driver's license. So people are making the choice to drive without a license because it's necessary for their survival, um, but it's also putting them at risk in these kinds of stops. So at that point, someone is, you know, someone forgot to signal, someone has been racially profiled, and they're now having to ask themselves, do I not get home today? Um, uh, like uh, Rachel, attorney Weber said so clearly, something very small has now escalated into something extremely dangerous. Um, and so the, the difference in that scenario between being recorded and not being recorded, much less being recorded to NPD's servers versus being reported to the cloud is immense, uh, as I think you can see, right? NPD's agreement to not share data with ICE means that if they are stopped and they are not being reported to the cloud, there is a possibility that that driving stop doesn't ruin their life, right? That the driving stop can just be a driving stop and cannot mean immigration detention cannot mean the torture conditions that are immigration detention in the United States, might not mean being deported to a country where their life is at risk, um, might not mean that their children don't have a parent in the country anymore. Um, when someone is reported to the cloud, though, that option is basically gone. Um, there, if that information is in the cloud, NPD no longer has control over who it's shared with, how it's shared. Um, and we've seen lots of information from, from various other activists about how the agreements in place about how that data is shared are not protective. Um, but even more importantly, for the experience of the person being stopped, the person who's in terror in that stop, they don't know what the agreements between NPD and whatever federal agencies are and whatever private companies are they know very clearly how much danger they're in in that situation. And I think it's incumbent on us to not put people in that situation, to not escalate the terror of what's already an extremely difficult position to be in. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the first scenario that I wanted to share. And I, I do wanna emphasize how really common this scenario is. Um, there are people, plenty of people I know who will not drive through Northampton and who will drive through East Hampton because it's not safe for them to drive there because of the possibility of being racially profiled, the possibility of being stopped. Um, 
Uh, and so the other thing that I'd like to talk about really quickly is uh, the scope of federal surveillance of immigration populations. Um, we talked a lot at the last city council meeting about ICE and agreements with ICE because ICE is the most well-known federal agency that surveils um, and incarcerates immigrants. Um, but I just want to talk about a couple more. Um, so first, the Department of Homeland Security is the umbrella organization that ICE falls under. They have a lot of other branches as well. DHS was founded in 2001 um, by the Patriot Act. And when it was founded, it was given very broad powers to do anything relating to quote unquote homeland security. What that has looked like, especially since 2018, is surveilling uh, United States activists of various stripes. Um, I first noticed this in uh, my groups when we were doing humanitarian aid across the US-Mexico border. Um, the Department of Homeland Security built profiles on most of the activists that I was working with. Um, that later turned into a court case because you know it was, it was illegal, but what they were using to build those profiles were private companies like Motorola. Um, uh, Chief Casper noted that an, a federal agency can't access the data there ostensibly without a reason. DHS and other federal agencies are very good at finding reasons. They will pull whatever surveillance they want using any kinds of requests for information. It doesn't have to be you, Elliot Oberholzer, did something that made us suspicious. It can be this entire class of people is suspicious to us, give us all of their footage so that we can run facial recognition on it. Um, so that's one federal agency. The other federal agency that I'd like to highlight is the FBI. Um, something that uh, people who don't work in immigration a lot may not know is that a massive shift happened after uh, September 11th, 2001. Um, and the FBI became deeply involved in immigration matters if the person immigrating was Muslim or if they decided that they were Muslim because they happened to be from Somalia or whatever. Um, so the, the, since that time, um, for the last 20 years, um, when, you, when we ask um, surveilled populations of immigrants, who is it who comes to your door? Um, it's not always ICE. Sometimes it is the FBI. And what people say about the FBI is when they come to my door, they know everything about me. They know my name. They know when I entered. They know where my children go to school. They know where I work. They know all of our family members. And they are leveraging that information to try to get me to interact with terrorist organizations and then inform to them. So this is an extremely common way that another federal agency, the FBI, interacts with immigration populations. And what they use surveillance information for is not just to surveil people, it's actually to put people in dangerous situations so that they can inform to them. Um, so that's a little bit about sort of the scope of the way that various federal agencies will access this data. Um, and so what I mean by sharing all of that is to first to make uh, our Northampton's immigrant population visible in this discussion. Um, and I'm not an immigrant myself, but I do feel like there are barriers to sharing this information for people who are actively in fear. And so it feels like our responsibility to consider it. Um, and then secondly, to, to say, as you're considering your rubric and you're considering, okay, what's, what is important um, for us to consider about this technology, I think the, the baseline thing to consider is that if it records the cloud, the data is not safe. If it records the cloud, federal agencies will access that data. If it records to private servers owned by a private company, federal agencies will access that data just pretty much uniformly. And the last thing is that when uh, a private company sells information or gives information to a federal agency, often we'll never know. Um, and the reason that we won't know is that you cannot do a Freedom of Information Act request for a private company. If NPD gave information to ICE, we could do a Freedom of Information Act request and ask NPD what they gave. If Motorola gives information to ICE, we can't do that. They will not tell us. Um, and so there's another piece of it that when that data is managed by a private company, it is suddenly out of the reach of any attempts at transparency as well. Um, thank you so much for your time and for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Elliot.
Do we have a few more hands? Um, let's, um, Dan Kennedy. Yes, Dan Kennedy. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Awesome, sorry, I'm on my phone, so I was a little nervous. Um, so I'll keep this pretty short because I think uh, so many other folks have um, sort of gone through and said a lot of what I was going to say <laughs> um, uh, in terms of, of Motorola. But I think coming back into practical terms, I think one of the things, um, you, I, I know you're tasked with looking at creating a social responsibility or social equity rubric um, for this purchase. And I don't know if it would be applied to others. I feel like one of the things that, you know, sort of snide to say, but just like if you're on a UN uh, watch list, you can't, like the city of Northampton won't contract with you. We would consider that socially irresponsible. Um, I, but I think to the larger point though, um, and Elliot already mentioned this, one of the things that we do have to think about and to operationalize are what are our community values? Uh, what do we think, um, what do we think is important and how do we, you know, how do we commit to that? Um, if we think that facial recognition and um, surveillance is against our values, then I think one of the things that we would wanna say is we don't wanna participate with a company that does that or that engages with that. Um, I think you'd even expand that to say that we don't want a company that goes around the will of the cities that that contract with it to do that. I think one, um, people have already mentioned um, the lawsuits against Vigilant, which said um, to its host communities, we won't, um, you know, we won't, we won't use your data, we won't sell your data, we won't give it away. Um, and then finding out that they were actually doing that sometimes without having um, some of the necessary um, warrants to actually collect that data, they were just asking for it and would get it. Um, or they would just ask for it and would give it away. So I think part of that is going to be, how do we make sure that the data that we collect or that um, the ways that in which a tool is used do not contribute back to something that is against our values. Um, and so and I bring up Vigilant because they were purchased along with WatchGuard and several other companies by Motorola, um, all under this sort of security package. Um, and so, and that's where they're, so Motorola is offering um, this tool, which is also still gonna be using um, Vigilant's um, Face, facial and um, license plate recognition stuff, um, their AI. The other part is that we also wanna make sure that they're not training on that data. And all of that becomes very difficult to do um, when you don't have access to that data, you're not in control of it. Um, and that's what happens when you have cloud storage, right? There's another group whose IT is maintaining that infrastructure. Um, there's another group who is responsible for um, auditing your data and everything else. And you don't have to know, right? So um, a lot of the communities that are finding out that their data was shared against their wishes or without their knowledge um, from Vigilant, we're finding it out after it had been shared. It wasn't, they didn't know that it had been shared. And so um, anytime you have cloud infrastructure like that, you are opening yourself up to vulnerability. And if that vulnerability represents um, or goes against what we have as community values, that's a bigger problem. Um, right, and so without local storage, there's not really a great way around that um, because again, the government just goes to a third party. It doesn't go to you because when you're doing something that's cloud storage, you don't actually own or control your data in practical terms, um, right? That, that's just the nature of it. Um, and then finally, I think going back to some of those values, um, I think it's important to be able to articulate what the benefits of a technology are um, if we're going to adopt it or continue using it. Um, so I would urge us as a community to have larger conversations. Again, this is probably outside of just this finance uh, committee meeting, but um, to think about what are the values that we have? What are the benefits to a technology? What are the harms of that technology? And how do we balance those um, in ways that are meaningful? And then how do we operationalize that? I think saying, well, we don't want facial recognition or we don't want surveillance, but then having cameras that are in fact recording whenever they're on um, is problematic. Um, and I, again, I think being able to articulate what the resolution that was passed means um, for to prevent downtown surveillance, if there are police cars that are storing that, storing surveillance data, even if it's for a little while, 
Uh, I know the chief said that, you know, they get overwritten at a fairly regular rate, but that doesn't mean they're not recording. Um, and I, I know it's a little annoying, but every time someone says these things go back in time to record something, they are not going back in time. There is no magic time machine. They are just recording and then accessing that data. Um, data that is stored temporarily and then overwritten is still data that is stored. Um, like we, th that's, that's just the sentence there. So if we're against that, um, for all of the reasons you know, expounded above and because we want that as a city, um, I don't know how to exactly include that into a rubric other than being able to, um, there are some other cities that have done this. They've really created diver, um, uh, direction statements. They've created sort of strategic outcomes that they want for their city. And then from those, you can sort of divide um, devise like a social equity rubric or social responsibility rubric. Those are large projects though. Um, so I just don't want to underestimate the amount of work or the tasks that you've been given either um, to say, come up with a social uh, responsibility uh, rubric in what is what could be a few days, maybe a few weeks um, as a as a subcommittee is, is a pretty big ask. Um, everything else has already been said, so I'm going to stop and uh, let someone else speak. Thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, Dan. So I'm seeing uh, just two more hands. If there's anyone else, let me know, because what I'm going to do after um, we hear, I'm really, um, I'm glad we're getting this, you know, to hear from the public. So we'll listen, we'll listen to the two last folks, and then I'm going to call for a five minute break. Make sure the kids aren't bringing the house down for a second. <laughs> so I hope you will indulge that. But let's first hear from Lemmy and then Ezekiel. Hi, um, my name is Lemmy Coffin. I've lived in Northampton basically for like 10 years. Um, I wanna to touch on a fairly new member of our community, Marty the robot at Stop and Shop. Stop and Shop tells us that Marty is just a friendly neighborhood camera to detect spills and help assess stocking needs to make your shopping experience better. However, I hope we all know that this technology what this technology is actually doing. It's looking for shoplifting. This robot is also likely tracking our shopping patterns and giving Stop and Shop information about where to put the most expensive stuff around the store. The comments from Director Pagan and Chief Casper at the last meeting similarly lay out dash cameras as something that is helpful to us, when in fact it is more likely going to work against the community's interest. Just like we have to think more critically and no, Marty isn't just there to detect spills, we have to think critically about the incentive structures behind, this, behind contracts such as this one. Director Pagan and Chief Casper kept assuring counselors that we would maintain ownership of our data if we signed this contract. In the best case scenario where we do own the data, which we don't actually know because we can't see the contract, we definitely will not own any metadata gathered from the information we provide to Motorola Solutions. So sure, maybe Motorola won't be able to go make a commercial or sh a short film with our dash cam footage because we technically maintain ownership, but that guarantees nothing in the data sharing industry. They absolutely will be able to run their own software on our footage, gather data, and will sell or release to corporations and federal agencies. On top of that, what, just, what Dan just said, even if stuff is deleting itself, they could run meta metadata analytics on the data that's being deleted constantly and still be gathering data that they're storing elsewhere on footage that is being constantly deleted. So they could have algorithms running on data that we think is being deleted, but they're still garnering data, metadata from that information. Um, data gathering is exactly what keep, metadata gathering is exactly what keeps companies like Motorola Solutions in business. I believe we need people more qualified on proprietary data sharing to weigh in on this in a full scale hum human rights impact report on this technology, which I would argue almost no one employed by the city of Northampton would qual be fully qualified to do. Even the best case scenario laid out by Director Pecan and Chief Casper, which I believe contains major oversights and naivete, has major pitfalls if you truly understand how data management companies work. For example, in the city council meeting, Director Pagan and Chief Casper asserted that we would get notified if our data was used. I think a lot of people covered this, but we wouldn't even be able to actually stop anything, even if we get the notification. Um, and I think their comments actually demonstrated why they're not actually qualified to weigh in on this fully. Um, because 
Casper said that she has no knowledge of federal laws that would compel Motorola solutions to produce data to federal agencies like ICE, but of course she doesn't. These types of federal policies are far beyond her scope as a local police officer whose duty it is to lead a police force on a municipal level and know the ins and outs of local and state laws. She's not qualified to speak to the federal cat and mouse game that is national data management companies relationships with federal agencies like ICE because frankly, few people are. City officials ignorantly signing contracts like this is how this harmful system of data sharing and all this crap continues. And it is way more harmful than an individual using Amazon. I know the, the sort of logical conclusion might be like, well, I use Amazon Prime. What's the difference between signing a contract with Motorola Solutions? But here on the city level, we have different institutional power to make an institutional difference that we don't, we as individuals actually have less of an ability to do, right? We have, we're somewhere in local government, which is why I actually ran for city council. We're somewhere in between an individual and like a national, you know, crazy big institution. We're a small local institution that has net more power than an individual. And it's way different than what like Councillor Elkins was saying about just like, you know, signing up for the prime membership for convenience. It has more impact than that. Um, so, and on top of that, Director Pagan and Chief Casper never fully denied the technology's capability for predictive policing. I believe the predictive policing point was really, really under addressed at the last meeting. Um, so more than an additional item on the rubric, we need better expert people who understand the complexities of all this to weigh in on the human rights impacts Northampton will incur by signing this through an impact study. There's no way to have, there is absolutely no way to surveil the community in an ethical way, but we shouldn't be, and we shouldn't be funding dash cameras at all. But if the, the, city, the city does decide to, sorry, if the city continues considering how to continue this harmful surveillance practice, at the very least, the public is entitled to the full details and impacts of the human rights issues coming up in this technology. Similar to an environmental impact study, we are entitled to the hard evidence about the supposed benefits the city claims to be getting by incurring these human rights harms if a dash cam service continues to be explored. I actually, like a little bit different than Dan maybe, think it's well within the scope of this committee to mandate a report such as this if any dash camera data management contract is signed, especially if it does not meet requirements of whatever social responsibility within the rubric. I think if, if it fails in the rubric, if it's true that every single company fails in that category of the rubric, then I think the city should mandate an impact, a human rights impact study um, because of the failure of the rubric so we can fully understand the benefits that we're garnering from the harms we're incurring, which is really similar to environmental impact studies. If you think about it, sometimes, you know, if, if the Route 9 bridge collapsed, we might have to just incur all these environmental harms so that we could get to Amherst. And similarly, if this is really what it is, which I don't think it is, um, even that catastrophic, then we need to know all the harms so we can learn how to mitigate them later. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Lemmy. Uh, Ezekiel, you're our last last up at that, but not least. Um, hi, everyone. I, I agree with a lot of what has already been said. I think whether, I don't think that investing in more dash cams is an effective or ethical choice for the city to make. I do just want to talk about procurement and social responsibility as it sort of is, is on the docket for today. I'm not sure that there is a socially responsible choice around procuring dash cams. I think there, there are really huge problems with a lot of the companies working in this space. I think there are big social responsibility implications for all the procurement the city does. And so I wanna encourage the, the finance committee and the council more broadly, as well as the, the mayor's office and the procurement officer to really think about what are we saying by how we're spending all of our money in procurement? Everything that the city is buying every vendor the city is engaging with, every contract the city is entering in, this element of social responsibility is at play. And so I think that there, this is a broader conversation than, than can be sort of solved and addressed today. I think we could make, and I hope that you will make a, a basic social responsibility metric. For example, are they on a UN watch list? We shouldn't do business with them. I agree with that. Um, but I think that there's there's a larger conversation to have here about how the city is spending money, who we're entering into contracts with, who our vendors are. And, and I think that social responsibility 
in a really like robust and thorough way should be a part of every every procurement process that the city engages in. So I, I think this is a little bit beyond the scope of today, but I, I just want to sort of plant that seed that there's, I think there's a lot more work to do here around how we're spending our money. And and I really agree with what what Lemmy said that the the city is not it's not the same as an individual's Amazon purchases. Like there's a there's a bigger weight to this. The money is on a very different scale. And so I, I really hope that um the the council and the finance committee can take this up and really think about how we can be spending our money more responsibly, divesting from unethical, harmful companies. And then by extension, divesting from fields that are just unethical, kinds of technology, kinds of purchasing where, where there is no ethical person to buy from, it's, it's just, that means we shouldn't be buying that kind of thing. And we should be figuring out different ways to move forward. Um, that's all I've got for today. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Ezekiel. Okay, folks, let's see, it's 628. Let's do some math. Um, oops, excuse me. Let's do five minutes. So let's take a five minute break and then we can start, um, you know, we can talk to um, hopefully um, Joe Cook, our procurement officer and start a discussion. So five minutes, I'm gonna turn off the recording. I'll see you back here at 703. Okay, so uh, we are being audio and, and video recording, just a reminder, <laughs> and uh, we are back. And I want to clarify what I think uh, needs to happen now. We have some department heads here, um, and they probably need to skedaddle soon. So I thought we, the committee members, could have um, a, a discussion with it, with with them. And then, um, and then they'll be free to go. And then, if uh, we can see where we're at in terms of some question, you know, some back and forth or question and answer with um, with our resident, our public. So, I see um, uh, committee members. You can uh, let me know what you'd like to. I know that I would uh, love to hear from our procurement officer. Just a basic, um, yes, mayor. Yeah, I would. I was just ha would love to just introduce who's here and oh sure, that'd be great. Um, just to kind of bring us back to the pending question, you know, what's on the floor from the order uh, that's before you is whether we can enter into a five-year contract. So it's not a financial order, although that's where it's appearing on your agenda again. Um, it's a contract uh, over three years. A contract over three years requires a council vote by mass general law. So. Um, so for replacing the camera systems, the question before you is whether we would enter into a five-year contract, which has been determined by IT to provide a better service program and cost savings to the city. So um, we have on tap, we have our chief information officer is here again, Antonio Pagan, um, to answer any technology questions. Though, so, you know, I think he's given a lot of answers to the, some of the main questions that we've heard, uh, but he's available. I've asked the city solicitor to be here um, to answer any legal questions. And our chief procurement officer, Joe Cook, is here to talk about procurement law 30B and um, procurement processes. So they're very happy to go over that information and answer any questions from the finance committee. Wonderful, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, yeah, so do committee members have questions? Let's see, President Nash. Thank you, Councilor Maori. Um, yeah, so the starting point for me, hello, Mayor, hello, Antonio and, 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 and Joe. Um, uh, Thank you for being here. It, my, my biggest questions are all for uh, really for Mr. Cook, uh, because I, I think this, you know, we've been tasked with coming up with criteria, which I think somewhere within the city, you know, that we already have a good deal of criteria are already in place. And that, um, and that I think it might be helpful for framing what that criteria is in terms of when we when we go out for when things go out to bid that because the contracts are larger and um 
and Mr. Cook, if, if you could speak to that, um, I know that's a very big question right there. So, um, um, sure. Um, give it a hello. shot. Yeah. Uh, hello, counselors. Uh, nice to see you all. Um, chapter 30B is the uh, Mass General Law that uh, governs goods and services. Uh, so it's not construction, it's not architects and engineers, uh, it's just uh, buying stuff and services. Uh, under 10,000, uh, we use uh, sound business practice, uh, which means if you have bought stuff before, maybe you don't have to do anything. If you haven't bought this item before, you, you would go out and uh, do some internet searches or you know what you would do in your own life if you had never bought something before. If it's between 10,000 and 50,000, you, you seek three quotes using a written purchase description. Uh, you don't actually have to get three quotes, but you do have to solicit three quotes from people in the business of selling that item or that service. Over 50,000, we go out to bid. We do an advertised process. And when we when we go out to bid, do we have any criteria that we use around um, social responsibility or, I mean, for example, um, that uh, we have ordinances in place in, in terms of the, um, that we, we can't go and procure items from companies that produce nuclear arms. Um, you know, how do those things, how do those things come into play when we, when we do a, a bid over fifty thousand uh, dollars. That's a great question. Um, I, when the topic came up, I inquired of the attorney general's office about uh, whether this was something which we could um, take to uh, the skill, ability, and integrity of a bidder and reject them. Uh, in, the, in the construction field, uh, we get to make a decision about skill, ability, and integrity. We can reject a low bidder. Um, if we feel they're lacking in the skill, ability, and, and integrity. And the answer I got back is that um, skill, ability, and integrity uh, goes to their business practices. Can they build a high school? Have they built high schools uh, previously? Have they paid their subcontractors in, in a timely fashion? That sort of thing. They said we could not uh, use participating or having you know, uh, some sort of corporate relationship with a company that has uh, work in the nuclear industry, we could not use that to reject a low bidder. Uh, we, after that, we uh, went through the special legislation process, got a law passed just for Northampton that said, we can do this. So if, if we wanna have some sort of social responsibility uh, criteria for, how we let, let contracts, um, going special legislation would be a safe harbor for us uh, and that we would have specific permission to use uh, a very specific, uh, you guys are calling it a rubric, uh, whatever system would describe exactly what it is that we don't wanna see. Uh, and the legislature would say, yes, you can do that. And, um, and then it would be clear to the inspector general's office or whoever we're, uh, might be in front of with a bid protest if we reject somebody. Yes, we can do this because the legislature said we can do this. Follow up question. Okay, so um, so the items that so um, when all right in terms of Motorola that we we can select three. Um, you know, we, we're supposed to get, because of where this con this contract lies, um, that uh, we're required to get three bidders. Is there a place that we go and get these bidder these vendors from? Uh, well, we have to uh, advertise. We don't have to get a, over 50,000, and this is well over 50,000, I believe. Um, we advertise it in the local paper. The, there's a goods and services bulletin put out by the uh, Commonwealth. Uh, there's a combi system also put out by the comp, uh, and, and it's a big internet site, you know, tons and tons of vendors on there. Um, so that's how we advertise a process. 
uh, we also put it on the city website. And we would say, you know, we want to buy this system that has this capabilities. Uh, we might have vendor qualifications like you've uh, had 10 clients before that you've sold this exact same system to, uh, you know, the, you must have a, a, a repair shop within 200 miles, whatever, you know, the, the department describes what they want, what sort of guarantees they want, how long they want to see that business in business doing this sort of stuff. Um, so it's it's very much up to the department usually. But we, but within that ten to fifty thousand dollar range, that's the one we're in right now for for this particular contract. That I believe I we're over one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We look at the entire length of the contract that's possible. That's that's probably. I think we're at over one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Well, if that were the that's case, then we'd be going out to bid, right? Right. We would be going out to bid, or we can use uh, existing contracts like the state of Massachusetts has contracts we can buy from. Uh, there are cooperative contracts uh, put out by bidding co cooperatives. There's a number of those. And also the federal government has contracts we can take advantage of. So I, I, I'm wondering if in this case that this is, that Motorola is one of those state contracts that that we can go directly to and negotiate with? Uh, yes, they're on a state contract. Uh, they're on a cooperative contract, I know also. And do we know if the Commonwealth has also, you know, we're, we're talking about applying some sort of social responsibility or just some sort of rubric to say, well, you've said that skill, what was the middle one? Skill, blank, and integrity? Skill, ability, and integrity. That's a, uh, from the construction laws. Okay. And, and so basically, that's, that's the state measures to become a, what I'll call a qualified vendor for the Commonwealth. Uh, for construction projects. So we make decisions uh, on a very much project by project basis. What are, you know, what are we buying? What's the risk? Uh, what do we want to see in our particular thing that we're doing right now uh, to assure ourselves of having a good vendor and a good product? Okay. All right. Um, all right. This is helpful, and it means I need to do more thinking. Thank you. Oh, wait, <laughs> if you know whatever we come up with, um, you know, or whatever you guys come up with. I would love to, uh, you know, what I would always do with a department that has any uh, new approach to something, I take it to the inspector general's office, if it's a good or a service and say, is this okay if we do this? If they give us a good, you know, a green light, we're good to go to put it in as a part of our bid. And so all the bidders know what the standard is in order to win the contract. If they come back and say, like the attorney general's office says, no, you can't do it that way, then special legislation is something we could look at, you know, with the mayor and, and the council agreeing on something to request for special legislation. Gotcha. Thank you. Councillor Labarge? Yes, thank you, Councillor Miori. Councillor yeah. Labarge. Hi, haven't seen you in a while. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but nice seeing you, Joe, and thank you for being here. So are you also working on this contract for Motorola Solutions? Are you working with Antonio on this contract? Uh, they've been carrying all the water on uh, investigating with the, uh, the police department and um, they're just doing an incredible amount of research on what is the best, what does the department need and which company's products best fit that need? Uh, and we, we had a conversation today and they, they have done their homework. There are, there's a state contract, there's a couple of cooperative contracts, I believe, which we could use and just buy material without bidding. Or we can go out to bid and buy the Motorola that way or whatever uh, you know, the department needs. Could, could I ask how many other companies have been looked at besides Motorola? solutions. Uh, Antonio could, yeah. I mean, and 
we're just not looking at one company. Have you dealt with others? Um, Antonio in IT has, has done that. They've looked at all the different uh, companies that do this sort of work, have this sort of equipment. I have not done that. Okay, because I have great concerns, Joe. I mean, there is a page, 1,800 pages, the ACLU documented. And it's very, very interesting about this company. Okay, with ICE, their connection with ICE. So, you know, uh, tonight we heard Mr. Baskin talk, and I agree with what he said tonight, because I'm really uncomfortable hearing and reading 1,800 pages on ACLU about this company. And, you know, I mean, we're hearing that, which was mentioned about the chief tonight, from one of our residents in the city, which there was a statement that she did state. And I, I, I feel like right now I am so uncomfortable here being a sanctuary city and taking a company that there is so much that just to read about what they're connected with. And ICE is big time, cloud is a big time, and where is the safety for all our residents in our city? We're a sanctuary city and reading about them does not make us a sanctuary city. So I think to me, every contract that comes in that this type of an issue really needs to be looked at here. I don't want our residents being in fear and this is what's happening here again. And we're gonna get more people and more people coming out because they don't want this. And me as a counselor, I'm very careful here. And 1800 pages is a tremendous amount of knowledge from ACLU on this company. So right now, I don't know which way I'm gonna turn because I'm not, I don't feel safe with this company. So I don't know what is ever gonna change my mind here, but I know you're saying that a lot of research has been done on this company and it's with the state, but the ACLU is actually stating that the state and the federal can come in and ask for documentation on this technology. So I'm like this, I don't know which way to go. Well, the technical details definitely could be addressed better by Antonio from IT. He's, he's the expert. Okay, thank you, Joe. I, I just buy stuff. <laughs> okay. Councillor Moulton. Thank you. Um, I want to follow up on the questions that have just been asked by both councillors Nash and Labarge and clarify uh, with either procurement officer Cook or attorney Seawald, are we, can we, may we reject a contract with uh, uh, Motorola uh, because of its involvement with ICE? Or do we need to go, do we need to write an ordinance to that effect and go through a home rule petition? Um, what well, I can chime in from our experience with the uh, nuclear industry, the answer we got that time was uh, going with special leg legislation was what was required for us to do that. <clears throat> if I may, um, you know, at this moment, um, we have no criteria by which to judge Motorola um, and to apply to Motorola. Um, you know, so the question here is whether the mayor is authorized to enter into a five-year contract. That's really the only question that's before the council. And I'm sure that perhaps that, you know, that question is informed by your opinion of the particular vendor, but uh, that's not really an issue here because it's, it's not a criteria that exists in the city of Northampton to apply to um, a proposal. 
And, you know, as, as uh, Mr. Cook just said, um, when we tried to uh, apply the nuclear arms industry prohibition, uh, we needed to go through the legislature. Now that's to be distinguished from local requirements that inform about how the company does business as opposed to with whom the company does business. So for instance, we were able to apply um, a, a rubric regarding wage law violations and judgments for wage law violations because that goes to how the company does its business. That's completely different than uh, the question of with whom the company does business. And I think the latter would require a special legislation. Okay, so I understand that in, in the narrowest sense, the question before us is the virtue of a, of a five-year contract. Mm -hmm. But there is a way, uh, if I understand you, Attorney Seawall, that we can address how a company does business without going through the more cumbersome process of special legislation. Is that, is that correct? Correct. But, this, okay. but I just want to be clear that, you know, having, you know, contacts with ICE or any of these other issues that I've heard are, are not how the company does the business. It's with whom the company does business. Okay. And that goes to integrity. Uh, I'm going to sneak in a question. And <clears throat> Um, thank you, uh, Joe, for being here. If I had more time, I would have contacted you, you know, through email and gotten, you know, some of this information beforehand, but it was kind of close. So I was just, I want to go back to, um, well, two things. I, I, so, so why we did not go out for bid for this particular contract. And then the second thing I was thinking is, so we have this nuclear, you know, uh, weapons industry stipulation. But how, I mean, what, so what happened? I mean, do you go and then you see a company and then you start, you yourself research that? I mean, how do you, how, how is that going to play out in, in terms of how you make that call? So those are the two things I was uh, in my head. Uh, the departments always uh, research their, what their own needs are. Okay. Uh, and I know IT was heavily involved. Uh, Antonio and his, uh, his employee, Raphael, uh, did a great deal of research on what the needs were, you know, the from our side, from the police department side, and then what was available out there in the business world for this type of equipment. Um, and did a, a large amount of research on that. And then what are what's the pricing? Uh, where can we buy this stuff? Do we have to go out to bid? So, you know, we can go out to bid. We can use an existing state contract or a cooperative contract. They've and they have already figured out what the best deal is, what the best price is. You know, they've done a very good job of researching, you know, this express need, how do we meet that need? Yeah, they've done, um, you know, for the rubrics they have, they've, um, they've done, you know, a bang up job of, of covering those. And that's why we're thinking of rubrics that might have been missing that, you know, uh, for this contract. So I guess I'm still not understanding the process in terms of the, for example, the nuclear um, uh, weapons industry stipulation. So how would we know? I mean, this, who's going to check that, I guess, is my question. Maybe that's a, a solicitor seawall. Um, are we just going to wait for the public, you know, to send us, you know, an alarm, you know, alarming email? I mean, how would we know? How do we vet? If we make these stipulations, how are we, I guess what I'm really getting at is how we're going to vet that. Well, those are really two different questions. And let me just say that I, I'm not involved as city solicitor in the procurement process. Okay. Right. You know, Joe is a state recognized expert on procurement. He gives seminars, he, you know, and we, we have the skill we need in that area. So I don't participate in your in general procurement. So I couldn't really answer the question well, yeah. of I just make who investigates. Order. I know yeah. that for the oh. wage law violation, we asked for a certification by the vendor as part of the bid package that there are no judgments for wage law violations against the, the proposed vendor. That I know, but I'm not really sure how the, the, the nuclear uh, weapons issue is handled. Right, so we haven't, for example, you don't know of any company we have rejected on in terms of that order. 
uh, we have. Question. I can answer that. We we haven't. We we don't do business with any company on the the widest list that's available. Oh, okay. So you're there's a, there's some place you go to. Right. There, I, there was a list provided, and uh, we actually had done business with one company that used to be owned by somebody that has, you know, several times removed a relationship with a company in the nuclear industry. Uh, that the division we dealt with was sold and they no longer have that relationship. Right. I guess, you know, if we're going to be writing criteria, I, you know, I kind of wanted to understand what would, you know, how that would. Um, right. How do we enforce that? In, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see. Committee members. Yes. Councilor Nash. Uh, unmute. Please. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I have a uh, I have a question for Director uh, Pagan, which is Antonio. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned during comments earlier was had to do with how uh, whether we own our made metadata, and um, that I I'm not quite sure what um, what metadata is and okay. whether or not we you know, by having it go up to the cloud, um, could could you speak to that 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 particular piece? Sure. Uh, just to answer the question about met metadata, uh, the easiest way to understand is, um, you know, if you take a picture, mm -hmm. okay, metadata is all the information that is behind the picture, like you know what camera was used, what um, geolocation. Um, um, you know, what settings the camera had. That's right. metadata. Um, in the case of video, it's similar. It's all, all kind of information are behind it. Um, and, you know, we use, at the city, we use data for many things, not necessarily video related, but we do have a lot of data systems and metadata is a concept that we use all the time. Um, every time we, uh, we deal with any data, um, company, we always, you know, um, have a conversation about data ownership and data privacy and data sharing. So how those things go in terms of uh, their, the company policies and how uh, it goes in terms of a contract. And actually, uh, Joe is, is our resource for interpreting any kind of terms uh, in, that, in that area. Uh, not on the technical side, but on the size of, of you know, the language that is used on the contracts for any kind of terms of, of ownership and privacy and, and those kind of things. So um, we, we uh, the way we are looking into this is uh, number one, um, we want to be able to affirm to uh, all the constituents that we own the data. And, you know, I, you know, I, I just want to make, make sure that, that you understand that uh, on every single um, deal that we do with data companies, we always have this conversation. So the ownership of the data is unquestionable. We want to establish on any contract that the city owns the data. And when, when we say owns the data is we own the information that is captured and the, any information that is inherent to that as metadata. Um, now, what um, is being mentioned many times by public comments is that um, this data company use the data for you know, commercial purposes. That is one of the areas that we discuss with vendors that the data cannot be used in those senses. Uh, and actually uh, we haven't get to that point yet in this procurement. We are, as Joe Cook mentioned, we are over, you know, several months of researching uh, different companies in part of the process of procurement was to ask for authorization for a five-year contract before we get to the actual contract. As I explained last, last meeting, uh, we cannot get to a contract process without having the authorization from the city council for having a five-year. So that's why we are here today is just finding out if, um, if the mayor is authorized to sign a contract for five years. 
as uh, Mr. Cook mentioned, we um, during the process of the research, we found out that several of the vendors that we were looking at, they participate on different, different cooperative um, uh, purchasing contracts and uh, unstate contracts. So uh, based on you know the advice from uh, Mr. Cook, we know that we don't have to go through a, a bid process because we could uh, leverage one of those contracts. Obviously, if, if that was not the case, and we've done this many times, then we will go to a, a full um, you know, public bidding process, which normally we go through uh, Mr. Cook to ensure that we got all the uh, um, you know, steps um, done before we move forward. And uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but you know, the, the data ownership is, is not questionable. I think that's, that's um, that is a, it's a concept that is very, you know, people obviously talk about this a lot. There is one thing that I want to mention It's not part of your question, but I want to answer this question because it's not clear, I believe. So Motorola solution is a, is a you know, worldwide conglomerate that basically that their business model is buying companies that are successful and develop the products even further after you know, they uh, acquired uh, the companies. WashGuard is one of the latest companies that they have acquired. So actually, as a matter of fact, when we started the conversation with WashGuard, and I, I think that Mr. Cook um, was involved in this conversation almost a year ago, WashGuard was recently acquired by Motorola Solutions. So Motorola Solutions has not, at the time, had no uh, develop any technology with WashGuard. Any uh, new models are going to be coming on 2022. They will be developed by the new company, but really what we procure from the beginning, it was a WashGuard, washguard company, uh, manufactured product, which is the M500. That's the product we are acquiring, which is used by many other municipalities in, in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and Regardless of what everybody is understanding, the capabilities of that software is not at the level of surveillance that is being represented in these meetings. They are talking about Vigilant, which is another company owned by Motorola Solutions that does the face recognition and the uh, license plate recognition. But WashGuard at this point doesn't have those technologies implemented. I'm not saying that this is not going to happen in the future. It might happen because it's owned by the same company. It's the same parent company, but WashGuard, the way it is right today, it doesn't have those capabilities. Um, again, um, the and, and what is interesting, and this might not be relevant, but I just want to mention, back on 2008, Northampton purchased WashGuard as the uh, dash cameras for for the uh, PD uh, cruisers. Uh, and it uses it for five years before it, it moved on into a different vendor, which is Provision. So this is not the first time we, as a city, we work with WashCard. The, the difference is that this time, WashCard is owned by Motorola Solutions. It's, it's a, you know, something that might not be relevant, but it's good to know that you know, we have had this technology before. Uh, since 2008. It's not something new for the city and it's not something that has not been done before. I think that uh, and, um, our concerns in terms of uh, IT uh, capacity is to ensure that you know, we provide a service that is secure for uh, the PD staff and that um, is managed by our IT staff, because this is you know part of the requirements that we own and manage the data. And uh, even though it's a cloud-based solution, is uh, you know access to the data is governed by the city and not governed by the company that basically provides the service. And that is the same for uh, many other companies that we do business with. Thank you, Antonio. Well, thank you, Antonio, for that, uh, for clarifying the bidding process and that 
background information. Uh, yes, Councilor Moulton. Thank you. Um, Director Pagan, do any of the three vendors under consideration offer local storage of data? Actually, the only one that provides the, um, the local storage is, um, is Motorola Solutions. They, ha they have an option to do an uh, on-premise, which is basically the legacy product from WashGuard that uh, provides um, an on-premise solution. In, and we actually evaluated that solution. The, the only reason we, uh, you know, after discussing with the um, uh, PD administration, the Northampton uh, Police Department administration, we decided to recommend going to the cloud was because the capabilities of um, basically managing the data on the cloud was much more robust than uh, managing on the on-premise uh, solution, which means you know it, it takes a lot of more time and other third-party vendor solutions to, to manage the data on the uh, on-premise uh, solution than um, the, uh, the solution that they provide on the cloud. And just to explain that, the reason for that is that Motorola Solutions has a, um, a platform on the cloud that manage uh, video data on a much uh, robust way, which is not available on premise. So uh, can you, um, I've, I've reviewed my notes from your, your presentations the last couple of city council meetings and I, I don't see uh, uh, the, dollar values of the three-year contracts that this is being weighed against. What, what would it cost the city for those three other three-year contracts? Because one, one of the reasons you're giving for a five-year contract is savings. Well, let me, uh, let me clarify that. Um, and I, I, I'd be happy to chair the, the rubric. The cost was one of the uh, um, items on the criteria, but it was not, you know, on the weighted formula that we had, it was not the highest points on the, on the rubric. So cost was taken into consideration as part of, um, I think it was either five or six uh, criteria points. Um, and the savings was not really the determined point as a, as a sole point of, of this decision. It was within, you know, the other criteria that, um, and I can, I can definitely um, share that information with you. I don't know if I have it right now available on, you know, how, how much will be for three year contract on, on the other options, but the other option was cloud-based as well as, as the, um, uh, the Motorola solution that was only one um, solution or one option on on premise that could be a three year contract, um, but it was on uh, basically on on uh, uh, the wash car solution on premise, and I I can find that number. I don't have it in front of me right now, but I can find it if if you give me a few minutes. Okay, I guess I guess what I'm looking for is a very um, uh, it's just a way to compare the the financial cost to the city. This is a five year contract, one hundred thirty three thousand dollars. So it has an average annual value of twenty six thousand six hundred. How do how does that compare to the average uh, annual cost of the three year contracts that were under consideration? Let me. Um... Let me look up my numbers here. Yeah, on the rubric, and I'm going to read from my, my rubric here. The on-premise solution was actually the cost of the five year. If we, um, we had a five year contract with the same company, but on-premise, it was $102,000, 365. So it was less expensive, but it would not provide the, the same uh, capabilities that we have on the uh, cloud-based uh, solution.
Yes, President Nash. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you got your microphone unmuted. Thanks. Yeah, I keep muting my Zora okay. is watching TV in the other room, and it's <laughs> yeah, we all do it. <laughs> it would be inappropriate to. So, um, I you know I I'm going back to that that uh, those three words that uh, that Joe Cook shared: skill, ability, and integrity. And that I'm wondering, you know, around that word integrity, and it, it's kind of like where it, it, it kind of, it, it belongs to the Commonwealth, um, but it might belong to us to figure out what that is. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if there are, if there's language out there to describe what integrity is in terms of the Commonwealth, that, um, do you, Joe, do you know of that, or is there a definition of that? Um, uh, what the attorney general said to me was is that integrity was meant to refer to their business integrity, how they you know, went about their business, um, treat, how did they treat customers, did they right. honor warranties, that sort of thing, not in the larger sense of being a world citizen. And thank uh, you. You know, it's just were they a trustworthy company to do business with? Right. Okay. Oh, and I wanted to uh, point out that uh, our eagle-eyed mayor uh, correctly corrects me that it's $133,000 we're talking about. It's not over $150,000. It's the same bid regime if we don't make use of a, a state contract or a collective uh, contract. It, it doesn't change the process at all, but I did exaggerate the dollar amount a little bit. Nice. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and I never ever exaggerate, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, committee members. We, we do want the department heads to be able to, you know, go about their lives. So if we, if, uh, um, let's, if we have any more questions for um, them, that's fine to ask, but then we'll. Could I make a comment? Uh, we are so I, I should have announced when I saw some hands go totally fine to raise hands. Um, but but what we were going to do is finish up with the department heads because they have to go and then check in with the committee members and then we were going to um, interact with you all. And, and I see the question. So if you could, um, Amy, if you just give us a few more minutes, I, um, then we can um, call on you again and we can hear your your thoughts. Sure. Okay. I did. I did have a question for one of the department heads. I don't know if that was allowable. Um, uh, I, we hadn't planned on that. So I guess if, uh, I think Ezekiel, I would say that um, I'm okay with that question, but we, but I wanted, I just want to own that we cannot open up the floor for questions with the department heads. For everyone, so uh, just to keep that parameter for the audience, so they understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, I, I would, I guess, I'd say at this point, Ezekiel, why don't you go ahead with your question? Okay, this was just a question for Solicitor Seawald. So, I just wanted to understand the if there was to be like a prohibition, like the city does not want to do business with companies that work with ICE that would probably have to be a home rule petition, special legislation matter. But if, if individual departments were adding criteria around social responsibility to their process of determining vendors in the same way that cost is a criteria or other criteria, would that be allowable on a department to department level or does that also need to be some kind of special, special legislation? So in the hierarchy of, of the law, a, an ordinance would certainly take precedence over a, an ad hoc department by department uh, decision to add unstated criteria. So if we couldn't pass an ordinance, then departments heads could not just apply these criteria willy nilly at their own you know, cho choice. That would not be possible, Ezekiel. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. That's illuminating. Um, okay, committee members. Um, any other questions for any of our department staff before we set them free? 
Okay, so thank you so much. It was nice to uh, meet you virtually, uh, Joe Cook, and thank you again, Antonio, for your, all your time and thought. And so now that I want to just have a discussion, a, a brief discussion with the committee members about, you know, how we're going to proceed. And then uh, we can um, talk with um, some of the members of the public. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Nice to meet you all. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. You're better welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to check in about... Um, you know, I know I, I said we have some reference materials to kind of bounce, you know, ideas off of. Um, we could uh, start trying to hash that out. I kind of, I guess I wanted to check in with my committee members first to see um, what their thoughts are. I also want to make sure, you know, uh, we have a fair amount of people here, although not, not that many with hands up. So I would really like to be able to, you know, at least get one question or comment. In fact, yes. And, and perhaps more depending on, um, you know, the thing about the back and forth, what I said earlier is really what needs, to, you know, as a chair, I, I just, I have to make it as, as um, egalitarian as possible. So just so you understand uh, that. So if you have a comment you've already made, you know, that would, if you don't make it, you know, if you've already made it, then someone else will have uh, time for a question or a comment. So just to keep that in mind, it's, I think it's, um, working out pretty well. So, um, but yeah, any thoughts on the process? I mean, we could we could screen share the criteria. We could talk to the, you know, to um, folks with their hands up first a little. Um, I'm still, I'm still, you know, personally, and I don't know anyone else, I, I would, it would be nice to aim for, you know, eight or below, uh, eight or earlier, but I'm, I am, I do have some flexibility, but I wanted to check in with my committee. Yeah, not muted, so go ahead. <laughs> you noticed before me, well yeah. done. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I'm gonna tell you from this vantage and, you know, in terms of, you know, that as one of the committee members putting together that criteria that got shared and that um, in terms of the, uh, the information that, we got from city officials and from what we heard from members of the public, I, you know, I, there's way too much for me to come to a conclusion as to a rubric tonight. Um, I, 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 I think I, I need to um, uh, take a little time to think about that. I mean, I, I, I appreciated uh, Ezekiel's question because I, I, I think we were all kind of going to that same question that to really do this right we would you know we would need to come up with some sort of ordinance yep, and yep. that um and that that ordinance would also be applied citywide um in terms of all of all of the procurement that we do so if and in in the case of motorola motorola wouldn't just be out for dash cams they would be out for um uh, walkie talkies at the high school they would be out for maybe some video equipment that um that uh that we use in council chambers I, I i just don't know where it would go and that um and that that would be the you know that's a con that's something to think about because we that that with not when you're dealing with corporations you know we could say you know, we don't like it because, you know, they do this particular thing. And, you know, and I, I, I'm not minimizing, you know, activities that corporations get involved in, but that there's almost this whack-a-mole thing that you could end up in and like, we, we can't order a particular pen anymore, or, you know, that there's, it, it can just go so many different places. Um, so, this is all to say, I, you know, I, I, there's a lot to take in here, and 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 I am, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not ready to figure this out tonight in terms of a rubric. I also, I also want to say that I'm surprised that you know from the Commonwealth, there's not clear criteria that we can draw from, um, and that, that that sure would be helpful. That that if we as a 
city or town or as a city are trying to figure out <laughs> this thing and then build it back up and hope it gets to the state house. Um, you know, we can do things like that. Um, but um, it, it's, it's, it's a much heavier lift. And, and I do think that the question of whether or not our officers, our police department should have dash cameras is still out there. You know, they, there, there are two separate things going on here. Yeah. And that, um, that uh, so anyway, um, I'll stop talking there because I'm, I'm, I have enough confusion in my head to keep going for a while. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Moulton, I think, had his hands up, and then Councillor Labarge. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I concur with Councillor Nash. Uh, I was struck today to get my email a, uh, from the mayor's office, uh, uh, a memo, uh, subject, City of Northampton Recycled Product Procurement Policy, uh, which is designed to make and keep the City of Northampton a sustainable community. I would like someday to receive a memo that's uh, titled City of Northampton Socially Responsible Procurement Policy. And I think, I think that is what we're, that's the long-term goal here. And I hope it's not too long-term, but it's not gonna be done tonight. Uh, and I would start, uh, starting place would be to look at, at Berkeley's uh, socially uh, uh, sanctuary contracting ordinance that, uh, uh, that has been uh, distributed to us. Um, so I concur with Councillor Nash, we, we cannot come up with a rubric tonight, uh, but the, the question remains before us, are we, are we ready to, uh, to, uh, to make a decision on uh, permitting the mayor to enter into a five-year contract with, with Motorola? Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Barge. Yes, thank you. Um, I have to echo Councillor Nash. Um, I'm not ready to move on with this. My head is just like I've got so much in it right now that I like what I'm hearing from several of the residents who spoke this evening. And going through the ordinances that was sent to all of us with the information from Dan Kennedy is very, very interesting. And I have to agree with um, Councillor Moten on the Berkeley ordinance. I think the language there really, it, it attracted me because to me, it reminds us of our city here. So, I think we have a job to do in finance and we need to set up an ordinance. There's no question about it. We do have a city solicitor who I know would sit down with us and help us put the right language together in it. So. I think you got muted. Um, oh, Councilor Barge, uh, just unmute again so we can. How did that happen? <laughs> Anyways, I just feel that I'm not ready to say exactly how I want to vote on this because I'm, I'm really concerned about it. But I feel better if we could start moving on some on an ordinance with language. This needs to be done or otherwise we're going to just running into these problems. Not seeing the contracts that I have a problem with because if we had seen the contracts them working on it and talking with the companies, it would have opened the doors for us really early. But it comes to us and we know not that much about it on a first reading. And then we're getting inundated with all kinds of emails and, and phone calls. And I'm glad that the residents did do that because we were able as our responsibility as counselors to do that research. And like I said, I have read over almost 900 pages of the ACLU, and it's unbelievable. And I believe what they're saying in it. Mm. So I'm not ready to make a decision on that, but I'd like to see this committee highly get involved in 
designing an ordinance and getting the help from our city solicitor on this. Got to do it. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, solicitor Seawall, did you want to respond to that? I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page here and that it's not an ordinance that you need. It's likely going to be a special act of the legislature you're going to need. And so with that is going to come some, you know, intense scrutiny um, at the legislature. So we're going to have to be very, very specific in what these, what the criteria in this rubric that we've been calling social responsibility are. Um, the legislature is not simply going to pass a generic social responsibility requirement. So we're going to have to figure out what exactly social responsibility means um, and see whether the, uh, the legislature will pass it. And um, so I just want to be clear that we're not simply talking about putting together an ordinance and passing it and getting the mayor to sign it. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, Solicitor Seawall. Uh, oh, Councilor Labarge. Yeah, so hearing from our city solicitor that we're not looking at an ordinance, we're looking at doing a specific legislative matter here. And I think talking to our state rep, Lindsay Sabadosa, our Senator Joe Comfort, and talking with them, they're very, very brilliant these two girls and guiding us on our language to help us move it. That right. makes sense to, to me, Council Labarge. So I'm just, I wanna make a comment and then I, um, if you all are up for it, I'd love to, you know, uh, get some input from our, um, yeah. our residents. Um, so, um, or, or folks out there. Um, I was just gonna say, yeah, I'm just trying to clarify. So my, in my head, I see three things in front of us. This actual five-year contract, which is really what we were tasked with looking at, yep. in a sense. I mean, um, so we have the five-year contract, and whether you know this fin the finance committee, I don't, you know, is prepared to kind of recommend, not recommend, but mutually recommend tonight. We have this idea of coming up with a uh, rubric and a criteria, which, as I was compiling it, I felt like you know something we could do, and now I see that it's, it has to be done very thoughtfully. I'm glad we started. So there's that task. And then there's this lingering issue, which I, I'm really feeling is made, made clear from the public that they that there needs to be a place to talk about and, and look at the value of dash cams themselves. And whether that's uh, city services, human rights commission, some sort of public forum, I, I don't know. I guess we'd have to come up with that, but I don't want that to drop. So I don't know if you know this committee would feel comfortable making uh, recommendations like that to full council tonight or at, at, a, at a later meeting. So those are things to keep in mind in terms of just our work here tonight, what we're going to tell full council. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, Councillor Nash. So based on where we're landing tonight, because I, I think that, um, I think we all concur that the task of a rubric for social responsibility is beyond what a, it, it, any committee in the world can do in a two hour meeting. Um, and that, um, and that I, my suggestion is that we, um, we vote to send this back to city council with a neutral recommendation well, that, I, um, because- I didn't hear that council. That we, that we send this back to council with a neutral recommendation, that we also wrote, report back to council what we heard tonight and, um, and how we landed in this spot and that, um, and that we, we have a discussion with the full council on, on how to proceed. Um, but I, I think a, a neutral recommendation is a way forward. Uh, thank you, Councillor Now, so That's my motion oh. on the floor for a neutral recommendation. Can I get a second? <laughs> or actually, that's the chair's job to ask for a second. Second. Yes. Thank you, Stan. <laughs> um, is there any discussion? Uh, so, 
so this is, you know, something we do. And I would just say that I, I totally understand the neutral recommendation. I'm, I'm not comfortable, you know, I'm not com comfortable even with that at this point, um, because at this point, there's just too many questions for me to say that, you know, it's neutral for me. So I would not recommend this, but that's okay. You know, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, and if the rest of you vote, vote that way, well, you know, it will be a neutral recommendation. Um, but I just wanted to, to just be transparent about that. Yes, Council LaBarge. Yes, thank you. I think with what Councillor Nash and I think Councillor uh, Moulton were suggesting going neutral, yeah. they're not saying that they're voting for it. Right. Not. Okay. I know how I'm going to vote on it because yeah. I, I agree with you, Councillor Mayor. All right. There's a lot of information that has been given to us, huge. Right. And I am not inside here secure with what right. the company is. So even with a neutral recommendation, yeah. if we're sending it to a full city council to talk about this. And we might have a, a monthly meeting on this. And I'm not talking about 15 or 20 minutes. Yeah. You know, and I don't know, not unless you want to reschedule back here again for another finance committee. That's another option of not, don't close this meeting. Just say we'd like to rebook one. You could do it that way. Yes, that's another option. Uh, Council Nash, and then, yep. Well, I, I'm just going to say my motion's on the floor. Yes, and, I and, know. and I think if it gets voted down, then then we could figure out other ways to proceed. So, <laughs> and and as the and as the fill-in clerk, I'm I'm ready to take roll yes. whenever. So why don't we do that? And then I'd love to, you know, I'd love to talk to our uh, public here. Uh, so why don't you take the roll? Uh, oh. Oh. It looks like Councilor Labarge. Yes. Yes. Our, I see hands up. Are we going to have the resident speak? Yes. I what I had said was um, that we could um, that residents could ask questions or make further comments and be part of the discussion. Okay. Uh, with, you know, and then we'll we'll see where we're at time wise. I mean, but I think I, I'm I'm comfortable with doing that, um, and I'd really like to hear from them. Yeah, um, we're allowed. We're allowed. You know, it's a discretion of the chair that we can have a, a little right. bit of back and forth with our, you know, with, with uh, folks. Right, and I feel it's very very helpful hearing. Right, we're learning yeah. more information. Uh, Councillor Moulton, did you have something? Yes, could I just have President Nash explain? Um, what his uh, 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 intent is with a neutral recommendation back to the council? I, you know, based on all of the information that we've gathered tonight, I, I'm not ready to weigh in um, to say, I, I'm not ready to go for a positive recommendation. And I do think in terms of next steps, I think it's important for the full council to be able to weigh what those next steps might be. Uh, you know, are we talking about doing a home rule legislation? Are we talking about doing, um, uh, you know, a, a human rights, what was it that Lemmy had mentioned, um, a human rights impact study? I mean, all of this stuff is, is very intent, labor intensive and, um, and that um, I, I, I want to have that discussion in the full picture of you know what we're talking about here. Um, so, thank you. There's no more discussion. Um, you can put your other hat on. Okay, uh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish you had different hats. That would be entertaining. Uh, we'll do roll. We'll do. Uh, We'll call vote and then we'll talk to our to folks. Oh man, thank you so much. That is we go, right. There's no glitter, but it's still good. 
Um, <laughs> Councillor Nash, yes. Uh, Councillor Mayori. Uh, no. Uh, Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Labarge. No. Okay, so it doesn't carry. Sure. Well, uh, so it doesn't carry, but we can have this. We can, you know, the good thing about this is we can have this discussion with full council and, and you know, uh, and discuss that and also discuss, you know, um, what we recommend or what we are thinking of recommending um, in terms of next steps when we get to full council. If we want to be formal, we could come up with those steps and vote on them. I'm not feeling like we need to do that um, in, in that way, but. Uh, I can listen, to, I can hear from other committee members, but let's, uh, are you a committee member? Oh, yes, uh, yes, it's Council Moulton. Well, I just like to clarify for the public and for, and for me, what is the difference between sending this back with a neutral recommendation, which is no, no recommendation and, and sending it back with a failed neutral recommendation? What, what, what's, what's the difference? <laughs> this is something I've never experienced before. <laughs> so um, that, uh, yeah, um, let me, you know what, you know, what? why don't I think about this? It, it, you know, so usually we're tasked with um, sending back things back to council with a recommendation, I suppose, since we weren't asked to make a recommendation here, we were asked to consider this rubric that I guess we, we could forego it. Um, so um, so maybe maybe that's fine. But I do see that there are two people here. Yes. And um, maybe that's the next step in. Fearless right. sailors on our Zoom. Yes. Oh, yep, Council Labarge. Yes, thank you. Um, to me, it's very important. I, I wanna hear the residents. And I think we should have not even talked about sending it to city council at this point until we let other people speak. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to start talking to our residents. You know, I would, uh, I'm, you know, I, I think we're going to check in in about 20 minutes and see where we're at. We don't need a marathon, but I really want to hear and they've been patiently waiting. So I'm going to um, go in order here. Amy, Amy Bookbinder. You have a comment or a question? Hi. Hey. Hi, Amy. Uh, hey, hi, everybody. Um, hi. I want to thank you for this great discussion. And also, I want to thank other people from the community who spoke. Um, so I haven't heard anybody say that, that you couldn't follow through with something at the legislative level. Um, that's the first thing. And secondly, it, you know, if we're going to try to go in a more short-term fashion, um, in terms of so-called integrity as a rubric, you know, I heard a lot of examples, and I'm sure there are more, of a lack of integrity in terms of this company having violated agreements that they made uh, in various cities. Um, and, you know, I can't remember the specific things, but at the last city council meeting and tonight, again, I heard examples of that. So maybe that's a way to go. Um, you know, if a company makes an agreement and then violates it and winds up on the blacklist of the UN, and has all kinds of, you know, civil rights, human rights groups opposing it because of how they violated agreements. That's, that's not much integrity. So maybe that's a way to go. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate that. I also want to remind committee members that they actually can ask questions of um, folks who are in the meeting with us. So you go both ways if you have one. I might have one. Uh, for someone. So let me, um, uh, let me. Thanks. Um, I just, I, I'm very confused about this idea that 
you need a home rule petition to use the authorization power that you guys have all been granted with, it seems confusing that the question wouldn't even be on the floor right now if you needed to petition the state government to give you the power to decline the authorization. So I'm just confused why the question is even called to authorize or not authorize if in order to use your power not to authorize, you have to meet some like very high burden of procurement standards. I know, Alan, you could probably answer this. Um, and then if you, for some reason, can't use your power to decline authorization, can you say, if we authorize this, then you must, you know, have an impact report or any of those things? Like, I'd like to know the path to that. Right. Uh, before Solicitor Seawald speaks, I just wanted to clarify something, which is, you know, council, um, we can vote down this contract. That's that's not what, I mean, that's, we don't, we just take a vote. Um, so it's speaking specifically to this contract, but, you know, to have a, right. And, and so I'll let Solicitor Seawald talk about the, the larger kind of having a policy issue. <clears throat> Uh, um, I, I, if, <clears throat> I'm sorry if I was misunderstood or if I wasn't clear. The mayor could sign a three-year contract with Motorola Solutions for this system tomorrow, if she so desired. The only question here, as I said before, is whether she can sign a five-year contract. And so this council can turn down for no reason or any reason the authorization to sign a five-year contract and let me, I'm sorry if I, if I was confusing, there's no requirement to go to the legislature for, this, for the city council to turn down authorization for a five-year contract. What we would need special legis legislation for is to start applying criteria such as we're talking about uh, here. Um, just uh, similarly to when we try to prohibit uh, doing business with nuclear weapons contractors, if we want to stop doing business with contractors who, for instance, contract with ICE, uh, that would be special legislation. We couldn't do that on our own. And so, um, you know, again, the city council can turn down the, con the authorization for a five-year contract. The mayor could sign a three-year contract on her own uh, without any authorization from the city council. All we're at, she was asking for in this uh, request was to add an additional two years to whatever contract she signs. May I ask a clarifying question about that? The, the five-year contract had its different stipulations than the three-year. The five-year had cloud service and and, um, and the city um, not owning the equipment. So there's, there's substance and differences between, the, it's, it's not just the amount of years, there's different things in the bundle, correct? And that's, that was my understanding. I, I honestly, I have no idea. I'm not involved in the procurement right. process at all. Yeah, uh, so I'm pretty clear that, so, that there's a, yeah. a different, and, yeah. You know, um, what, on whatever terms the, the mayor deems are uh, uh, in the best interest of the city, she can sign a contract for three years, uh, whether it's cloud storage or local storage with Motorola or with another company, she can sign a contract with whatever company she wants to sign a contract with for three years. Right. And that's true of all contracts in the city. Yeah, I'm just noting that the, it wasn't the two year dif longer difference for, I think, I believe wasn't the issue. It's the substantive difference in the package that, that comes with the five year contract. But, right, but the, but the issue before the council is two years. Whatever the terms of the contract are, we don't even know because we don't have a contract before us. Right. right. And so now the mayor would like to negotiate a contract for the, for the cameras that the IT department after seven months of investigation has recommended. Right. And, so, uh, and so she would like to sign a contract with that company for an extra two years above and beyond what she's entitled to. I have no idea what the terms and conditions of the contract yeah. well, are. The contract doesn't idea. exist. The, the contract just doesn't exist at this point. Right. Okay. So, um, David, Chris, next. Yeah, David, I think you're next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I just want to start off by saying thank you to the council for uh, having this second sort of public forum here. Um, 
because sometimes in city council, it's, you know, I understand there's business that needs to be done. So I just want to, you know, send my thank you for taking the time and actually listening to the residents and really engaging in the sub, you know, substantive discussion. Um, I just want to kind of echo a couple points that people have made. And I just sort of want to sort of almost propose something to you folks. Um, I really do believe we need a public forum about the need of upgrading the dash cams because we can get into the sort of minutia of the legality of these home rule laws and things like that. But I think fundamentally the core issue here is whether or not the city of Northampton needs to do this. And so I would encourage city council to think about that as whether or not we actually need to make this upgrade in this purchase in the first place, as well as the sort of, I think you said it best council in Missouri, having a wider public forum so folks can actually discuss this in a more concrete way. Um, because I think at the core, that's really what this is about. Um, because a, a, a sort of social justice rubric for lack of better phrasing, I think is gonna be very difficult to, to create as Councillor Nash has st stated. So I think it's important that we actually get to the root here, which is, do we need to do this in the city of Northampton? Should the mayor even sign this three-year contract regardless of your guys' approval or support? That at the core is what this whole discussion is really about in my view. So I just wanted to kind of put that idea out there and yeah, so thank you again for hosting this meeting and taking the time to listen everybody. Uh, sure, thank you for that, David. Yes, I, I do agree about uh, finding a, a, some place to unpack the, the kind of secondary issue that's come out or not secondary, but we definitely have more than one uh, issue here happening. So, okay, so uh, Dana, and I have a question for you, Dana, after you speak, so maybe <laughs> don't go away right away. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. So first of all, uh, before I even say anything, I just wanted to get a sense from you, Rachel. Uh, I know, I mean, this. I don't know if this is Alan's experience, but in my experience, usually by the time you're discussing uh, the duration of con is that me? you're also negotiating substantive terms. So it would be normal contracts right so it would be really strange if as alan said there's no contract they're just talking about a duration with no substance but there will be a durate two different durations and then once once uh uh the mayor picks a duration then i guess negotiations start that would if alan's right that would be a really unusual i know he said he doesn't have anything to do with procurement so he wouldn't be sort of in in the weeds on this yet but it's a very unusual contracting process uh, usually substance comes before duration and then you sort of figure out you usually get more benefits as you you know increase the duration because the in the the uh, companies will make investments in infrastructure for you so um, I was sort of confused by that uh, statement of the mayor's process that they were just negotiating duration first and I would love to hear a little bit from Alan about if he know, and if he doesn't I totally understand he says he's not doing procurement but if that's his understanding of how the process goes, uh, I guess I wanted to know, is that his understanding of how the process goes? That these are sort of blank contracts that are being negotiated duration first. Yeah, I, I'll just say that I, I have been surprised when we, some, we, you know, when I first got on council that we'd get these um, kind of orders in that order. I mean, in that, so that we wouldn't know, have all the terms in front of us, um, you know, so I would, I, I was actually curious about that too, about, um, you know, about the, about the way it's laid out and, and, and when, when we vote, um, you know, so Solicitor Seawall, did you want to? You know, to the extent, I, 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 my understanding of this particular contract is very limited and, it, and, but I do understand that this type of equipment has a particular shelf life and and at a certain period of time it needs to be replaced and that period of time is approximately five years and so that's why five-year contracts are offered and so uh, it's not unusual for a city or town to first uh, seek the authorization for a five-year contract so we know what we're negotiating about because three-year contracts oftentimes and i don't know anything about this particular contract or this particular process, but um, three-year contracts often have very different terms uh, than five-year contracts. And unless a mayor knows whether 
uh, she has authorization to sign a five-year contract. It makes no sense to start negotiating around a five-year contract. So, I mean, there is a chicken and egg thing here, and I understand that, uh, but uh, it does make sense. And it's the way I've experienced this over the years is that uh, if there's a need for authorization for an extended contract, that um, that is uh, uh, sought first, and then the then the uh, terms and conditions of a five-year contract can be negotiated. In that case, I think it makes so much. Amy, you're breaking up a little bit. Um, yeah, she's to have and say, I understand that your process is usually just say, we don't know what, I guess it sounds like what, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. It sounds like what attorney Seawald is saying is that Motorola's proposal has been uh, pick three or five, and then we'll tell you what we're negotiating. And then they're asking the council pick, uh, basically pick three or five. If you vote no, it'll be three, but not really telling us what we're voting for because the vote the, the what it's for, the end of terms comes after. And I have to to do a public appropriation. So I would definitely suggest pushing back on Motorola about that and saying that like our council doesn't vote on things blindly. We need to know the terms of what we'd be voting for and also the terms of what, and then from the mayor, the terms of what would happen if it down. What are you? What's the next step for you? Are you gonna? If if you do a three-year term contract, what is that stability is being vested in? To vote on it without knowing it is um, really problematic. And I think that Motorola shouldn't be putting the city in that position of keeping the contract sort of silent until until they get a five-year authorization. I also think that this gets to Jim's question of what's the difference between neutral and no vote. The no vote means we don't have enough information to decide whether this is good, bad, or indifferent. Neutral means we've decided that it's fine. It's not good or bad. It's, pro it's probably not bad, right? Not good, not bad. It's just a thing that's happening. Um, and that implies that you have more knowledge than I think you do. And that's just sort of... Cut out. She's fading out. Yeah, she's fading out. Cut out, Dana. I do I oh, we lost you, Dana. To say the last, the last sentence. What did you say? And I think that gets on what I want as a member of the public. What I want my legislature to be doing, because you guys are my legislature. I don't want you to vote on something if you don't. If Motorola is not telling you what it is, mm -hmm. they're just telling you either authorize five years, and if you authorize five years, we'll tell you then what you authorize. But we're not going to have a conversation with you until you authorize it, because why would we bother? And I don't think that's an appropriate way to negotiate. And I think to negotiate contract terms, it's certainly not the way it's done in the corporate world. I tell you that much. So like that, it's just not, it's, that's not a negotiation among equals. So I think that's a reason to say no, but I also think that that's, and that's why I was saying the difference between neutrality or not, that I would say, don't say that that's fine. That's indifferent. You can say we don't have enough information and therefore we're not returning with a vote of good, bad, or neutral because literally Motorola is not telling us what's in the contract if that's what's going on, as Alan Seawald suggested it might be. I just, I, I want to make a comment and just own that I, ha I am uncomfortable with that. I was, uh, I'm uncomfortable when we vote um, and we don't have basically all the information laid down. I, but this, of course, this isn't just for this contract. We have, we are in that position a lot of, uh, you know, a lot on council. And um, yeah, I hear you on that. I hear you on that. Um, I do too. Uh, oh. Let's see. Uh, well, okay. Have, uh, Solicitor Shewal, do you want to answer that? And then uh, I, I, I just want to respond. I, I, obviously, I didn't hear everything that uh, Attorney Globach said uh, because she was going in and out. But I, I, I did hear her suggest that what Motorola is saying is, you know, go get a five-year contract. If you can't sign a five-year, if you can't get authorization for five-year contract, you sign a three-year contract. I don't want the impression out there that the mayor has suggested to me that she's going to sign a th three year contract or that she's made any decision like that. Um, I, all I was pointing out was with this contract, like with every other contract, the mayor has the authorization to sign a three year contract. And that's all I was saying. Not that the mayor has any intent to do that, that Motorola is you know, exerting any pressure to 
get a five year or we'll give you a three year. That's that's never been a conversation I've had with the mayor and I and I don't want to leave that impression at all. So Councilor Moulton and then we'll hear from Dan. Uh, my understanding is that uh, Director Pagan and the mayor don't want to negotiate the specifics of a five year contract until they've been authorized to engage in a five year contract. Yeah, that's my understanding. Yes, it is. Um, okay, Dan, did you want to? Um, yeah. Uh, chime in? Thank you all for, for doing this and sort of getting through the weeds. And I think, you know, hearing the process described a little bit, you know, I had the same sort of thoughts as Dana, and I'm glad that, you know, that's already been been asked is, is sort of why is this process so strange and I'm sure there's I'm sure there's a logical reason but I think we it still leaves us wrestling with um, how do we address that right so how do we like to say I would like to be authorized to negotiate a contract for X amount of time without knowing what that contract would would be seems a little strange um, but I think the other question that I have and this is for any anyone, I know a lot of people have been on council for a while. Um, what is the relationship and and the the process? Should you say I want more information? Um, like, what is the process for requesting more information or um, for maybe uh, getting more information about the alternatives that that have already been considered? Right. So to say, well, Motorola has a, a five year that's um, you know, that that's got cloud storage and other things. And then a three year that doesn't, I, I mean, for me right now, as it stands, the biggest concern that I have is around cloud storage, um, in terms of immediate concern, right? Because that's the one where and I will go back and forth with, <laughs> um, director Pagan all day and say, cause I work with, with things in cloud storage and the answer it, you own it with quotes, but if somebody accesses it, you don't know it. Did you, do you own it, right? Like, is it yours? Do you have full control over it? Um, and I think that's literally w where the other cities have been in, um, in that situation where they think they own it, but somebody else had access to it. Um, and they, they didn't even know it. And that's the, that's the, the part that's a little frightening or a little bit concerning. Um, with local storage, you don't have that as much because in order for a federal agency to request that information, it would still have to go through the city. So you'd at least know that that data was being requested, even if you couldn't say no, and ultimately you know, had to turn over information, at least you would know that it's happening. Um, so if there's a local option, you know, what are the, I mean, there are concerns and, and I think, um, they were they were already stated which is you still have to administer it you might have you know and that takes labor and time um you know and, and there's upkeep questions and things like that i think those are all valid to ask but basically how do you get the discussion going um exactly. and and i guess the other part is what what is the process to engage with the mayor's office and i'm Again, I'm still learning all of these processes. <laughs> <laughs> trying to keep my head, <laughs> um, trying to, to wrap my head around all of all of them as they go through. But like, what is what is the process, and where do the powers end? Could you return something to um, City Council with not necessarily a yes or a no, but a we need in for we need more information? Or if you got that information, could you return? something or could city council return uh, rather than saying yes or no on the authorization saying, you know, we recommend you explore another another option and then have sort of redirect to maybe a second choice, right? So, uh, Council Barge, did you want to answer that? Uh, I think so. <laughs> Anyways, I did mention it at city council that we've never even seen the contract, Dan. And I have problems with all this. And then I knew for a fact, if it goes to city council, say we did vote on it tonight. I mean, there was two that sent it with a neutral recommendation and two of us know. 
The problem is what you heard Attorney Seawald state tonight, which is true of what he has stated. Once it goes to city council, and we have a long, you know, talk on this problem that we're having here, which is total communication with that company, with their contract. I mean, I don't know why that contract has not even been worked on, why it has to be signed first. And then if we say no on it, the mayor still has the rights to go ahead and sign the contract and it's in place. So I am so uncomfortable with the way this is being handled. And I'll say it again, I think with something like this, that it's coming out of the mayor's office, no matter what it is, or even like with Joe Cook from 10,000 to 50,000, I think counselors should be able to know who is being hired in the city, what contractors, and be able to have access to that contract, period. We handle financing and so forth. The residents, the taxpayers, the renters in here want to know where their dollars are going. And I'm having a problem with the way this is being handled with Motorola Solutions. It's I'm really upset with this. You sit down with a regular contractor, no matter who it is that we've dealt with in our family, we see a contract, we work out a contract, you see the language. So the only people that are gonna be dealing with the language is not now, because if we vote no against this at city council, and it could happen, you never know. And then the mayor just signs it. And then that will give her access to go ahead with Antonio, I think, I'm getting this right, to be able to put the language in and include it in the contract. I don't know, city solicitor Alan Seawald, am I correct about this? It's it's just getting overwhelming. When well, let's see, Councilor Nash was next. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-oh, I think you're Keep muted. Muting, yes, sorry. Um, so um, that, yes, the contract hasn't been signed because we don't have a contract because the contract hasn't been signed. But I think that, you know, in, in terms, yes, there's lots of information that's been shared here, but the terms of the contract have been pretty clear as to it'll be five years, it, it, it'll cost this much over the five years uh, that, uh, you know, that it's going to be cloud-based storage, that, um, that the, the terms in, include that um, the um, uh, that there won't won't be any facial recognition. That we wouldn't be opting into services that read license plates. Now, whether we trust this organization to actually do all of that, I mean that that that's also part of the question here. But I, I think the terms of what the mayor wants to go into agreement on it 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 is kind of clear. So. Um, that now you know so i i just wanted to say that yeah so i guess i would just take one more stab at um dan's question and just say the short answer is really our our formal power is just to not vote you know to vote down the, the five-year contract generally you know since i've been a counselor the mayor's office is very gracious about entertaining questions and yeah. you know trying to work with us um, and that's great, but that's kind of really, that's the discretion of the mayor's office. I mean, our, our, our formal power is really, I mean, we can't demand, you know, more choices or more information. Um, you know, it's, it's really just a vote yes or no. Um, yes, Councilor Nash. Yeah, and I, I concur with that. That is our, that is, you know, it, it's, it's really coming, you know, it comes down to, mm -hmm we can vote yes or no on this and that, um, and the, the, you know, whether or not we, we, we think the mayor should, you know, in, you know, go into contract on this agreement based on the terms that we've heard so far. So, um, and then if we vote no, then the mayor goes back and, you know, does other things, tries to come up with another plan if she chooses. 
So and I, just, I just wanted to add also that we, you know, I'm sure I'm sure that the mayor would look at recommendations we handed her, but again, there's no formal way in which she's, you know, um, obligated to do much more. Um, yeah. So, um, so we have, okay, Councillor um, Moulton, and I, I want to don't forget we have Yap Ping there, and then it looks like Council Lombard has her hand. Thank you. Uh, oh, well, how let's, uh, Councillor Moulton, why don't you, and then. Yeah, I, th I think that um, a, a no vote by the council against a five-year contract uh, sends a message that we're uncomfortable uh, engaging Motorola for five years. And I think that message would be heard by the mayor's office. And I, I think that that would be taken into consideration. Yes, the mayor uh, may uh, enter into a three-year contract with any of these companies without without any council action. But I think if that's the vote of the council, uh, that message uh, would be heard and I think would be taken into, into consideration. Okay, so, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Council LaBarge, and okay, then- I'm the gonna other. echo exactly what um, Councilor Moulton just said. Awesome. Yeah, Ping. Hi, thank you all so much for tonight and opening this up to the public. Um, I, I wanted to pose a question. Um, I I was just curious, I, I'm hearing so much great discussion about, um, and I'm hearing a lot of concern from counselors about Motorola Solutions as a corporation. And I think so many of us in the public really appreciate that and appreciate the um, attention you're giving to the concerns that have been raised. Um, and I, I was also curious, you know, I think, the public comment at the city council meeting the other night and the public comment from people tonight. Um, I heard a very clear message, not only of, um, you know, Motorola Solutions is a scary corporation, but that communities of color are being um, extra criminalized by more surveillance technology in the hands of police. And, you know, all of the commenters were commenting on, we, we don't want Northampton's money to go towards giving the police more money to surveil people. We want the money to go to programs that we know can really support our community in ways that uh, the community members themselves agree upon. And, and I was just curious how, I think there was a little bit of mention tonight to the idea that there's two different issues, the Motorola Solutions Corporation issue, and then whether or not we need police um, tech surveillance. But um, I, I guess I, I was curious whether the counselors tonight heard the unanimous um, sentiment that community members and communities of color across the United States don't want police tech surveillance. It's not actually a question from, from communities and it's something that's been being promoted by um, police departments and the big tech corporations themselves and a lot of politicians, but community members, there is a unanimous call for, for no further police tech surveillance. And, and I was just wanting to hear from um, the committee members tonight, you know, what role hearing that plays for you in, in moving forward. And I understand it's beyond maybe the confines of, well, it definitely is beyond the confines of the conversation about rubric, but how much does it um, matter to each of you that you heard that from the public tonight and that you're also seeing information from the ACLU and from, you know, community groups across the United States, like how, how does that weigh for you? Well, thank you for that. Um, and I was going to pose this to the committee, you know, um, the way that, you know, I interpret that information is, yeah, this, this is, this, this is another issue and it really, demands, you know, it needs um, some, you know, it needs some community engagement and, and, and some deep discussion. So that's why I was hoping the committee members, and maybe we don't perhaps have to do it formally, but we can go back to council and, you know, if we were comfortable recommending, um, you know, you know, or having a discussion about where we can have that discussion, which is separate, the, the, you know, the efficacy, the, you know, the, the value or whatever of, of dash cam you know, technology being used in our, in our city and all that. Right. So, um, so that's, you know, for me, that, uh, that's what I got out of that, 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 that itself, whatever happens with this contract, that's, you know, um, even if Motorola, you know, somehow had sparkling reputation, I, I think what we're hearing is that there's this other issue that's, you know, um, and I, 
think, you know, if the Policing Review Commission could have gone on for, you know, a longer, you know, there was just so much there and they started unpacking a lot and, and that's just something that, that could be unpacked as well. And you know, I know it's frustrating with, you know, trying to get metrics and all that, but um, so that's what I, I took out of that. that um, but how about the uh, other committee members? Yeah, Councilor Moulton. So I think, uh, Council Mayor, you're suggesting that before uh, a vote be taken on any contract uh, by the council, that there be a a wider discussion uh, in a in a more in an arena that uh, that that invites uh, more even more community participation than we've we've heard at the at our meeting tonight in the last Thursday's council meeting about the need and the efficacy and the purpose and the impact of, of dash camps. Is that is that how I'm interpreting um, what you're saying? I, no, the only part that I, I, I wasn't saying is it, I don't think it's before we vote. I actually think they're kind of two separate issues. I mean, I'm not against, I'm just saying that what I was saying is we, we need to have this other train going where we're setting up this, um, some some sort of uh, place to unpack the, the 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 wider issue of the value of dash cams. I wasn't really connecting it to the vote. I, it was just kind of a separate, um, you know, whether that city services or some or outside the council, some public forum. I don't know. I, I guess I'd have to think about it. But yeah, so I don't have a, a time frame in terms of how that relates to the vote. I just think they're two separate issues. Um, but I'm open to ideas. Um, yeah. So um, I see, okay, there's two, um, I would say, you know, it's getting late, you know, late. If, if Amy are you up, you know, there's two hands up. If anyone had some final, anyone really had uh, anything else they wanted to say, but then I would just wrap up the, the public comment and just check in with committee members um, before we, you know, you know, we go, we end the meeting. Um, so does anyone else, you know, uh, out there have anything they want to say? Could I just re, I would really love to hear sure. Um, every counselor, how that, you know, how that community feedback and information weighs for everyone. And I thought, I think that um, Councillor Moulton, what you just mentioned about relating this discussion to this vote, I think you're hearing from community members that we do want that before the council just takes as a given that we should have cameras. So, but I'm, I'm super curious, you know, just what each counselor feels about the community feedback and the information. Yes, uh, well, Councillor Nash and then Councillor Barge. Yeah, I, I appreciate the feedback that I'm getting and that also that I continue to research this matter. I, you know, I, I, am, uh, out, I am considering uh, gathering in for, you know, I'm out there gathering information around dash cam um, effectiveness. And, um, and, and I am weighing all of those things. Um, I, um, we have a little over a week before the next council meeting. And, um, and so I will be looking at those things. Ya Ping, if you wanna send me any information, I think you've already sent me information around um, uh, many of the things that you've mentioned, but if you'd like to send me more or, similar information, I welcome that. So thank you. Uh, Council Labarge. Yes, thank you. Um, I really appreciate hearing from the residents. I think their voices are extremely valuable, extremely valuable, and they should not be left behind. We all need to work together to make this city valuable, to make this city safe for everybody in it. And we need to work together. And the more we hear from the public, I'm learning more and I thank everybody for that knowledge. And also too, I want to thank Ye Ping and several of them who have sent me emails and keep on sending them to me because I read them, I read them just like the ACL, I went and read that too. Like I said, I'm almost, I think, going up on 900 pages of that about 
motor and solutions and the problems with that cooperation. So yes, I appreciate it. I respect all of you for coming forth and talking. Believe me, as a city councilor, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it too. Uh, Councillor Moulton? Uh, yeah, I just want to echo what my colleagues just said. I too have read all of the emails that I've been sent. I've listened carefully to all the testimony and it is very valuable. And that's why I think that if we're going to pursue the idea of a, a, a wider community forum on the use of dash cams, it, it should come before a council vote on, uh, on allowing uh, a five-year contract. I mean, that's, that's, that's within, that's the, really the only thing that we can, we can vote on. Um, we can, uh, in asking for this forum and, and providing for additional uh, community input, we, uh, we can, I think, uh, help to inform the mayor's decision if a five-year contract is not, uh, is not permitted by the city council. Thank you for that, Councilor Moulton. Um, I think, so Ezekiel has his hand up and I don't know if Dana and Amy, Amy had any more to say. I just wanna say that Dana, I had questions, but you know, I'm, it's getting late. So I think I'll just follow up with you. There were just um, uh, some random questions about uh, criminal defense work and dash camps. But anyway, um, why don't we hear from Ezekiel and then uh, maybe Dana has something else and then we'll kind of start wrapping up. Um, or, uh, is it, is yeah. It yeah, I just wanted to to agree with that that last point that that Councillor Moulton made. Um, it doesn't. I think if there should be further community discussion and and a real chance for community input before the council were to consider agreeing entering into a five year contract, because if if the council approves a five year contract, and right. then there's community discussion, right. it's all very well and good, except that we're in a five year contract at that point, and so there's then we can't act on it. Um, as effectively for five years. So I, I think that the, that sort of intensive community discussion needs to happen before there is a, a vote on approving a five-year contract. Um, exactly. and, and then there are other possibilities beyond that, depending on the results of that discussion um, around ordinances too, I think. Right, I, it, that's a good point. And I just hadn't, you know, I, I'm not against that. I, I think that's a fine idea. I just was um, just really thinking that we, definitely need some place to unpack um, that, you know, the, the bigger issue there. Um, Dana, did you have something? Did you want to say something? Yes, super short. In response to Jim saying he's been doing a lot of research, one of the things that Will uh, Meyer had, it, when surveillance first became an issue back in 2017, Will Meyer donated Alex Vitale's book, The End of Policing, to the council during a meeting. Like he came up and handed the book. And I occasionally check in with the council and I'm like, have you read the book yet? Anyone read the book yet? You read, because it's a good book. Oh, it's really helpful. Helpful. <laughs> Maybe it's in the um, council office, which we don't go to anymore. Wow. But it's I there. Also, as of right now, it's a, I think he made it free. Like you can go on his website, you can oh, Google okay. it. It's now like a free download Who book. Who was the author? Yeah. Alex Vitale, V-I-T-A-L-E. Yeah. It's got a lot of research and history and like just a lot of stuff about what policing is for and what functions it serves. Great book. Will donated it. And occasionally whenever anybody mentioned it during the research, I'm like, have you read the book yet? Because I'd love it if you read the book as part of your research. And I don't think Jim has. No, <laughs> I don't think he has yet. He's saying no. And we're all so busy and I understand. But I just wanted to make sure everyone knows that that book is there waiting for you if you want to do. Uh, it's sort of a great primer on all of the issues that we've discussed today. Well, thank, thank you, you Will. Um, thank you, Dana. Um, I think that's it for folks. And that's, I, did Amy have? I think Amy's hand's just there. Um, so I'm gonna just say we're gonna start focusing on just closing the meeting. And I really, I just, I really just have to say to our, the folks out there, I'm just really grateful. I know it's a long meeting, and to, to have to, you know, wait and sift through a lot just to get to this point it shows a lot of dedication, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to check in with folks. I think, let me go back to our agenda. We have the financial and the new business. So I guess, you know, I feel I, I wanted just to check in about the next steps for our finance committee. You know, you, Council Labard brought up the idea of, of continuing this meeting. Um, 
I, I think, it, yeah, I, I'd love to hear ideas. Um, we have a council meeting, you know, um, but I do think this is a big, big project. I feel like in one, you know, we might have failed on some level in terms of this, you know, getting a criteria out, but I feel like we gained so much in terms of direction here. But um, yeah, so any ideas about that part? Do you want to um, just bring back what we've kind of gathered today, uh, bring back the full council? Um, we could continue this meeting um, to, to work on a criteria. Um, I'm a little concerned that, you know, it's it's a bigger job than even that. Um, yes, Councillor Nash. Um, so we work at the pleasure of council and council assigned us this task for this meeting. Um, if we felt like we needed a little more time between now and next council, we could consider doing that. But I, I think that um, that I, I don't think this committee has the power to continue discussing this item. Um, yeah. So, I mean, uh, yes, the, you know, the, in terms of this item, it's it's go, it's still at council, and it'll be at council next Thursday. Right. So, um, right. as far as if this committee wants to take up matters uh, related to procurement. Um, I think that fits under the heading of finance. Um, but I, I, again, you know, going back to full council because there's different components at play here. So, um, so that's my thoughts. Yeah, I just don't want to get an F. Don't you don't worry. want to get a what? I don't want to get an F. <laughs> <laughs> the student and me, I, we were given an assignment and I see why it's a big assignment. And you know, unfortunately, what we can't do is we do have a skeleton. We didn't. I was thought we would, we'd screen share it, but we didn't. That's okay. But, you know, and then work on something. Unfortunately, we can't do that outside the confines of this meeting. You know, because we'd have to all vote to you know to right. recommend this document we came up with, like a criteria document. Mm -hmm. So, um, so are you all comfortable with uh, what we'll do? You know, what will what we have to bring back the full council then? Which is mostly it is what it is. Yeah, it is. I'm sorry. Yes, Council Moulton. Well, so far, what we have to bring back is a failed neutral recommendation, <laughs> uh, which is uh, uh, confounding, I think. Um, what I think, I, I think we that we agree that we're not prepared to make a recommendation on a five year contract until there's been a wider community discussion on on the use and impact of dash cams. Uh, can we recommend that the, uh, that the council uh, uh, facilitate that discussion? Uh, you mean come up with a criteria? Like no, a, I'm talking hmm. about a, a community discussion about oh, the dash right. cam. About dash cam, yes. I mean, that's what I, yes. That's, I would very um, much like us to uh, recommend that shit. We could, you know. Right, but we still have to vote on on this because didn't we get a deadline March 1st from Antonio? That, that was his that was his hope, uh, Councillor Barge. Well, I understand uh, that, Stan. Well, so. I, I asked the question if there's a contract that exists that's going to expire. There is no existing contract. Mm -hmm. So he had How hoped to, that. yes, but I, I don't think the March 1st deadline uh, is 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 going to uh, there's going to be any in impact if if that's not met. Other mm -hmm. than the fact that there are re unreliable cameras that are still being used. Right. Plus the fact is, I think now we have city council on February seventeenth. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the second reading, and there is the clock is ticking on this. Correct, Councilor Nash. Isn't the clock ticking on this? I think there is clocks, multiple clocks ticking. <laughs> yeah, multiple is great. <laughs> I mean, there's, I will just point out there's other options, um, like delaying votes. If I'm mean, just saying there's lots of, there's other possibilities. Um, but uh, I'm just looking at the calendar. Yeah, the 17th. Um, so we can go back to, would, would you like to all, I mean, would you like to, vote to recommend um, 
did, I, did someone, did, I'm sorry, did Council Obrage, did you say that? Did, vote to recommend, a, or, or maybe it was Council Moulton, a, um, that, that full council um, find, the, you know, find a place for this discussion on the dash cameras. Is that, is that what you said, Council Moulton? I said that the finance committee is not prepared to issue a recommendation on a five-year contract right. until the right. full council has facilitated a larger community discussion on dash camps. Right. Right. Okay. So um, would, would anyone care to make that into a motion? Yes. Okay. I'll second it. Okay. Roll call. Of, I won't make you switch hats. It's getting late, but. Dash cams. <laughs> Forum. We'll be saying that all night. Um, so the, the motion was made by Stan and then seconded by Marianne. Yeah. All right. Um, and is there discussion? Yes. Yes, so, I, I don't know what's going on with this computer. All right. Yeah, so I, I'm going to vote no against that. And I'm going to tell you why, because I'm uncomfortable with us uh, getting into a, I mean, like I said, there is a lot of different clocks going on here. And that, um, and that one of them has to do with, there's, what people are talking about here is a, is a pretty deep, complex discussion. And in the meantime, we need to figure out whether these cameras are, uh, whether we're gonna replace the existing camera system, which is failing. And that, um, and that I, I, I'm not comfortable sending that recommendation back to council. I think council needs to, uh, you know, weigh that, the, the entire council as to how we're gonna proceed. Um, so, um, that's, that's my position on that. I would just, I'd just like to say though, um, I would it change if, the stip, you know, if the stipulation wasn't connected to the vote, if we're just recommending, you know, a place for this discussion about the uh, dash cams, I, and it wasn't contingent. Oh, I, I understood it to be connected to the vote. Yeah. No. Huh. No. That's, that wasn't my understanding. But I yes, understood. Councilor Moulton. I, I could I very easily could have gotten that wrong. <laughs> Councilor Moulton. I'm suggesting that we give the council a reason why we're not ready to make a recommendation yet and to explain why we had a, a failed neutral vote. That's, uh, we're not, I'm not. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I mean, the one thing we will bring to council, you know, is this discussion that we had and, and the looking at criteria. I think we knew it was a long shot that we were going to come up with some, you know, finalized criteria in one night. Um, so, I mean, we'll bring that, we can bring that to full council. Um, we have the motion on the floor, though. Um, yes, Council Labarge, and then perhaps yes. we should read the motion again. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's what I was questioning because mm -hmm. I know for a fact when Stan had made that motion, it was to bring exactly what he said to full state council that we had not made a recommendation. I, 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 yeah, I guess what I right. I'm sorry. I feel like I interrupted you, Councilor Labarge. Do you want to finish? I'm sorry. I do that when it gets later. I, I guess I'm saying, um, I guess I was trying to find, I, I, I gravitated towards Council Moulton's um, motion because I was trying to find any, you know, a few things that we could kind of agree on and formally recommend back to Council. Again, trying to get, you know, a better grade with Council. <laughs> so maybe, you know, I'm, I'm open to, but that's, that's why I thought that was one thing. Um, but if we don't agree, that's okay too. But I'm just saying, I thought that was one item that we could kind of come come out of this and say, it's, I think you know we recommend that this be an impacted city services or this you know this issue of the dash right. camp. Um, 
There was a misunderstanding, yeah. so. Yeah. Dan, can you repeat your motion that we re yeah. recommend back to council? Uh, my motion is to explain that we are not prepared, that the finance committee is not prepared to make a recommendation on a five-year contract until we hear uh, in a, a, a forum uh, to discuss the use and impact of dash cams until we hear further from the community. So I did hear it right. <laughs> right, I guess we did not hear it right. <laughs> It's good, this is why I really like re, uh, rereading uh, motions in council, uh -huh. especially as the meeting goes on. So it's good to reread it. You better make that the whole agenda. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if we, I, this is, we'll finish with this motion, but I don't know if we want to, what we want to tell them, you know, we'll we can just explain to them the criteria conversation since we don't have a formal, doesn't sound like we have any formal recommendations about uh, criteria, except that it's a, a very big conversation. But I'm sorry, that's, that's stay, let's stay on this motion since it's on the floor. Okay, um, the, the motion is to recommend that back to council that we not take up a contract, um, this contract, until there is a forum uh, with the community on dash cameras. Is that, is that good enough? Is that right, Stan? Yes. That's it. Okay. Is there any more discussion? Going to my roll call sheet. Thank, thank you very much, Councillor. Okay, um, I'm ready whenever you are. Ready. Okay. Uh, did you give the okay, Council yes. Chair or yes. Chair? <laughs> yes, I, I should not. <laughs> okay. Not. Use my voice, uh, Councillor Mayori. Yes. Uh, Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Nash. No. Okay. Um, okay. So that passes with one no. Um, so I guess the other, you know, wrapping this up in terms of what we're going to report to council, I, I suppose we can just have a discussion about the criteria. I, I feel like we need to tell them something. I, I guess we can work with our other councillors about you know, I, I, I still think it's uh, valuable to pursue it, but it's clearly not a one night conversation. Exactly. And we could, we could continue, you know, I could put it on it, you know, for future agendas and finance, but I am wondering if it's a better conversation to have with full council about where that actually, that come, you know, that work should be done. Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts? Yep. Bring it right to city council. Yes, Councilor Nash. Yeah, so those <laughs> materials were gathered from, um, they, they were sent to you as the chair to kind of frame the discussion uh -oh. and, and that you shared them with us, the committee members. Yes. And that, um, Sorry. Yep. yeah, I, I, I think that they're, they're helpful. There's the, the ordinance from um, uh, Berkeley. There is, um, you, you uh, pulled together documents from uh, outlining uh, the, the the nuclear arms ordinance and, and how that had to go through the state okay. legislature, um, the um, our safe cities ordinance, yep. um, and um, and that uh, I believe uh, Councillor Moulton had forwarded uh, some materials uh, from Harvard Business School yep. that. Um, that tackled this this discussion, and that um, so um, yeah, I I think there are a lot to go through tonight. It could be that if if this committee is going to take up this, I you know this may be the place to have that discussion about procurement um, and um, the um, uh, and socially <laughs> responsible yeah. and. Um, and I'm reaching the point where I need to eat dinner. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. that's why I was trying to wrap up. And I might have added Dan's, uh, Dan Kennedy's um, 
I mean, one thing we could do is, is um, you know, we'll have to do it the right way, but share that, you know, share the work we have done, you know, just that document mm -hmm. um, at some point with, I guess I'm just wondering, you know, this isn't a, what it wasn't actually a financial order. Um, and if it's going to be a longer process, I do wonder if this is the right place. Perhaps it is. If it's about procurement, perhaps it is. So um, are you so I think we should I think we should wrap up and we can just discuss our process around the criteria. I guess I was just um, wondering if you wanted to try to, you know, if, if anyone was feeling like we needed to meet before that and discuss it further. I'm, I'm kind of feeling like it's it's something it's a, it's kind of a big block of work. Yeah, we might need more uh, input and guidance from council, but that could be the late hour. Yes, Councilor Nash. I want to be clear that we haven't done any work. Yes. That what that what has occurred has been that we had an agenda, and that you, as the chair, were reaching out to me as to how to tackle this this particular item. Right. And I didn't mean work together. I meant, you know, we've all been I'm, I'm just, giving I'm the just framing in terms yes, of thank you. Thank so. you for that. I appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate that. We've all been working, you know, in our own, uh, you know, doing research and thinking about this, and I'm sure in, in our own way. But um, so what's the what's the committee's um, pleasure that way? Is that, if not, I'm going to I guess I'm asking if um, you would like to go back to full council first for more input about the process of um, the criteria, or if you'd rather um, just you know put it on future agendas for finance. Or do what? Or put it on future agendas for finance. Yes, Councilor Nash. I, you know, I think let's see what comes out of council next week. I, I think that um, that uh, that I, 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 I prefer when committees are taking up assignments that they're that they're aligned with the will of council. And I, I think along this, you know, to research, um, you know, ideas for procurement under finance would would get a um, would get a positive, yes. uh, you know, approval from council. But um, right. So that's my suggestion. My suggestion would be to adjourn pretty soon. Yeah, and, I agree. <laughs> I, I agree. Um, that's why I wanted to wrap it up. And um, I just want to say to my committee members how much I appreciate this because, you know, when we made those uh, lim time limits for full council in terms of public comment, part of the argument was that the subcommittees are where we can be, you know, more responsive. And so we really, we did stretch that tonight, you know, and, and try to be because of the weight, the gravity of the issue. Um, and I just want to, uh, um, to, to thank um, each one of you for sticking it out. But I concur with you, um, Councilor Nash. I don't feel the need to um, personally to schedule a meeting before council, you know, to try to get something else. Uh, I think uh, that's fine with me. Yes, Councilor LaBarge, did you have anything? Nope. Okay. Uh, <laughs> nope. Uh, Councilor Moulton. I just want to concur with uh, Councilor Nash and, and to say that uh, I don't feel this was sticking it out. This is serving the public good. It yeah. is. Yeah. I agree. I mean, Councilor Miori, if you'd like to stay till one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning, that time <laughs> won't come over to your house, right, Jim? Oh, you boy. Can't I, I can't tell if that's a promise or a threat, but thank you. No, but anyway, I feel grateful. I feel I feel very good about having some time to interact with the public because it is an issue of it is it's gratitude. important and appreciate it. I really enjoyed the meeting. Yeah, great. Well, if there's no further comments, um, I would um, entertain a motion. Yes, Councilor Nash. A mo I would like to make a motion to adjourn. I'll second it. Okay, roll call, please. Okay, so. Um, on that one, so I think first I'm trying to rotate things. If if I haven't done it right, uh, Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Here. 
Yes. No, you you don't yes, want to yes, be yes, here. Yes, yes, <laughs> you yes, want to go. Yes. <laughs> yes. And then uh, Councillor Nash, yes. Okay. And then Councillor Mayori. Yes. Okay. Oof. Okay, we are adjourned. Yes. Oh, that's that's the chairs. Go ahead, say it, Councillor Mayori. <laughs>